Okay. So my name is Larry Smith. Uh, I'm the field engineer technical trainer for Napoleon. Um, I am not an engineer by trade, so you don't have to worry about it. We're not going to talk engineering stuff. Uh, I'm an HVAC technician by trade. Uh, in Canada, I have my refrigeration license, my sheet metal, my gas, and I'm uh, wet certified for wood. Okay, so I, I'm from where you guys are now. I had my own business, sold it, and then ended up here seven and a half years ago working for Napoleon as a trainer. Uh, my part of my life, I have t over 20 years in the military as an instructor, so I teach for the Canadian Forces as well in the military. So like Eric said, totally open forum today. You have questions, let's just stop and talk about them. Uh, if you have a question and you don't get my attention, throw something at me. We'll talk about what you threw, we'll talk about your question, and then we'll move on from there. Uh, it is going to be up and down. You guys aren't used to sitting here, so about every hour we're going to take a break. If you need a break, just let me know and we'll stop, because uh, you guys are used to being up and moving around, not sitting down. Uh, we'll go through the furnace, uh, the live fire back there. We're going to talk about our furnace as well, so we have another furnace there, and we're going to go through about removing the heat exchanger on there. Um, for those who have not seen it or done it, it is the easiest heat exchanger to move in the field, to take apart. You can take it apart, I say 10 minutes, I got challenged last week in Vancouver and I did it in two and a half minutes to pull the whole heat exchanger out. So we'll, we'll see a video on it and then we'll do it. And uh, as you guys can see how easy it is to access the secondary, okay? We're gonna just do an overview of the Wolf Steel technical team and kind of how we operate as a team. <clears throat> and then we'll kick into the, the heat pump stuff as well, okay? My boss makes me do this, so I have to do it. I get in trouble. And that doesn't wanna work. Let me see me a second. There we go. <clears throat> so the Wolf Steel technical team, uh, before um, we, were, we were called Napoleon Education and we've changed the team when I came back on board. So when I started the company seven and a half years ago, I was and then when the world decided to take a holiday for two, two years, or about there, during COVID, I went to sales, and then they brought me back in September to the training side. Uh, and then we reintroduced the team as Wolf Steel Technical. And what we found is in the field, um, our training was great. Our support was not that great for technicians in the field. So if you ran into a problem or something wasn't going right or you had a bigger project and you needed some help, we had no support to give you guys out in the field. So we created the team and in the team, we have our education and then we also have, we don't need to worry about that. We also have troubleshooting now. We have on-site and virtual training. And then we also have on-site and virtual field support as well to support you in fields. So we have a commercial project uh, product um, called Conopack. It's for mid-rise buildings and high-rise buildings and that. Self-contained unit, like a magic pack uh, style unit. Um, for instance, I'm going two weeks to uh, the Twin Cities and working with a contractor on the whole project. From installation, we're gonna come back later and do a, a pre-inspection partway through the job and then we're gonna come up and do startup as well. And there's no cost for any of that to you guys as a contractor. So it's a free service that we provide, okay? Uh, in there, we also did uh, instructional videos. So on that little notepad, uh, your little hotel notepad, there's a QR code in the corner. We've developed our own YouTube page. So you can scan that and it will take you right to our YouTube page where you can actually watch videos on how to do things. So one of the videos we'll watch today is about the dip switches on the heat pumps. We have a two minute video on there on how to actually do it. There's none of the extra information on sales of it. It's just actually how to do the application. Um, we're just releasing another video, a couple videos on Delta T, Superheat, sub stuff like that. Little trips and tricks to help you guys in the field or someone new in the field. So it's easier for them to understand it, okay? And then, like I said, also our technical training and then our troubleshooting as well. We do have an online learning portal um, that's uh, available for our Fagger where we have technical videos, webinars, and product knowledge courses for salespeople uh, or, or a new technician. Um, to get set up for this, you'd have to go through our Fagger and through Eric, and they can get you access to this. It's an online learning portal, and that portal is designed that it's, the videos are, the, sorry, the courses are only three to five minutes long. It's all micro learning. Uh, they're three to five minutes long because us as adults, that's our attention span, maximum seven minutes. After that, we don't really want to do anything, right? You look at videos on YouTube, how long are they? Or how long do you watch the video? Not that long three to five minutes, you skip past it, go to the next spot, right? So this is the way the courses are designed as well. And they hold your spot so you don't have to start all over again. <clears throat> That's all self-paced. You can do it on your phone or on a computer or a tablet. And then 
Yeah, so that's kind of the layout on the courses when you look at it, and that's the YouTube page. And through there, like I said, you can do the for visual learning, and then also use it in the field as well. Uh, what we're doing as well, uh, we're updating our manuals for all our products, hearth grills and HVAC, and we're putting QR codes in the manuals. So when you get to a point in the manual and you need to figure out how to hook up the drain on a furnace, we'll have a quick video on it to do it so you don't have to read four pages of the manual the way it was laid out by an engineer, okay? So very easy for you, intuitive for you guys to use while you're in the field. Oh, see, I'm a little too quick. This is just a little quick shot of the videos. I know this one's going give you an idea kind of what they look like. This is kind of a montage of a bunch of different ones put together. So there's actually somebody doing it. And if, does anybody do hearth products, fireplaces? No? A four year old drew a picture of the logs on how they go. And it's very difficult as a technician in the field to see how they go. So we actually do videos now on where they put, where you put them and everything. So pretty easy to watch, they're short videos, right? <coughs> so what we also did on, on, with the technical training, like I said, we do on-site training, systems and operations, right? We do collaborative group work. Um, we send out uh, surveys and stuff to the contractors, and we do a program called FEP, so it's a field evaluation plan. If we design a new product, uh, working with Eric and, and our fagger, we'll say, okay, we got a couple of units, we want to test them in your area. And they'll work with you guys as contractors, and we'll, depending on how the program works, maybe give you a free unit, and then you get to use the unit and provide us feedback over a six or 12 month period, right? So we can get feedback from the field to see if it's actually a good unit. Is it set up properly? Um, does, is it packaged right? Doesn't come damaged, which a lot of stuff comes damaged sometimes with different manufacturers. So certain things like that. The hands-on training, uh, simulator training, uh, and the installation. So on there we have our technical support, training support, and sales and, sur and support. That's what uh, I do as a field engineer. Uh, and right now there's two of us, there's myself out of Canada, and then we have a guy out of Arkansas as well, currently in the company doing these as a field engineer. The one thing we brought in as well is a what we call a three-stage process. And what we found was uh, in the field as a technician, um, you were going to multiple calls, the same call multiple times, so 10 or 15 times and still not getting a resolution. So when I came back on board, we desi designed a three-stage process and the way it works is you get the call, I'll move the slide, um, we get the call in our customer solution, so we have our own 1-800 uh, number. I'll give you guys the number in the email uh, later on the slides, you can write it down. Um, they call and attempt to resolve the, solution, uh, the issue with you as a solution. If they cannot do it, they bring it to our, our second stage process. And out of there, we created a, a team that meets every Friday. There's myself, uh, the other engineer, field engineer, the designers of the product, and our representative from our customer solutions. We come up with a solution to solve your problem. And then the feedback comes back to you. If it is not resolved, we move down to stage three. And stage three has two options. One will tell you right, out, right off the hop, replace the unit. We'll give you a new unit, send that one back to us so we can figure out what it is on our end. Second option is, they'll send me out here. And I'll come out, and by the time I leave, it'll be working, or we know how to fix it, or it's gonna get replaced. We're not gonna waste these five, seven trips and multiple times to a customer's location. I know as a technician, when I have my own business, it costs a lot of money to send a technician out there multiple times to get things fixed. And you're not making money. And us as a manufacturer and any other manufacturer does not do a great job of giving you money for warranty. Right? It, you, for us, what are we, Eric? $65 for warranty labor? Yeah. Yeah. That's enough to start your gas, your truck, and go to, that's, that's kind of go to Dunkin' Donuts, and that's about it. Right? It doesn't even pay for the, the insurance on your vehicle for a month. Right? So it's not enough. So we want to resolve it right away. And the other biggest thing is we want the customer happy, your customer. We want you as a customer happy. We want our fagger happy, happy for us as a customer and create a good relationship with everybody. 
So that's our, our, our three-stage process. Now to help that, um, we have an application called Napoleon Live. So everybody does um, Navian boilers. Yeah, you guys, the live app on there, same application. All right? we can send you a link to your phone as a text message or by email, and then you select the link and ask, give permission for us to access your camera, and we can go live right on the spot from our people and customer solutions and help and see what's going on right on the spot. The other good application is if they're having difficulties and I'm available or the other field engineer is available, they can bring us into the call as well. So we can join in the call remotely and try to help resolve the issue. This is a great tool, and if you've never used it, it's an awesome tool, because as you know, sometimes the wires don't match up to the wiring diagrams, and if it's an older unit, someone's cut the wire out and changed the color of the wire, and we can actually see where everything's being tested and how that application is going to work. So it's a good, good tool to use. Um, and from there, we can record the, uh, whatever's happening in the field, and we only record what's live, and then we can actually work on it as a case study to support and repair an issue that's possibly in the field. What's the response time on this? On here? Yeah. Like if we need it, how, are we going to keep it on hold forever or is it like... Yeah, so the, the way it works is, um, they're, they're changing it. Uh, first you call in the customer solutions for the support tech support line, okay? There is an option on there to say that you're in the field. And you click on that and you say you're in the field, it moves you up to the queue. All right. Uh, be careful when you call in because on the manual there's two phone numbers. One's a consumer line, which you could sit there for three or four hours. All right. And then there's a tech line. And the tech line is the one you want to call in. Okay. Um, depending on how many calls are going coming in through the system, right? Um, sometimes you're on hold for two minutes. Some you could be 15, depending on what's going on. You do have the option to say as a callback option to hold your spot in the queue. And I've used it in the field because I call in sometimes just to see if there's something already going on in that unit that I don't know about. And I'll do a call back and two minutes later my phone rings. They're calling me back. But it just saves you from sitting there on the phone. Okay? So that's the tech support line. When they call you, or sorry, when they give you, start talking to you about a case, they will give you a case number. That case number now lives with that unit that you're working on for its entirety. Okay? So it's important to take that case number and write it down and have it with that unit, okay? Versus you can email them in and the email will give you a case number right away. And what they're doing is for that Napoleon Live, they're fixing up in the system right now, that when you email in, it will automatically email you a link to Napoleon Live so you can upload your own video. So you don't have to wait. And then they can review the case as soon as it gets uploaded and give you feedback, okay? So those are some of the tools that we have on there. Um, our tech support line will do the warranty process, application assistance, uh, parts, the me or me or Napoleon Live, and then they'll also give you the links to upload any cases that you have going on. Okay? With our product, <clears throat> when you have that and it exists with the unit as entirety, we can actually see everything about that unit because we build everything at our factory up in Barrie, which is an hour north of Toronto. I can tell you who was supposed to put that drain trap in that baggie inside your furnace. So if you get a furnace missing a part, if you emailed us and just said the part's missing, this is the part, right? It does twofold. One, we can get you the right part or get you a, a warranty claim for that part. The other one is someone manually put that in there. You can figure out is it one unit or is it multiple units that they miss it on, right? And do we need to train the person in our factory to do their job properly? Uh, I was bad as a technician. I'm like, oh, they, they didn't do this right. I just fixed it when I was in the field. Working now for the manufacturer does a disservice to the manufacturer because they don't even know they screwed up on the product, right? So if you're able to give that feedback and say, oh, the furnace showed up dented, even something quick like that, we can go back and look at that and find out why. Do we need better packaging, right? Is, do we have a, a guy in a fork truck or a girl in a fork truck that doesn't know how to drive, stuff like that? Good feedback for us. So you guys get good product in the end. Any questions about Wolf Steel Technical? <coughs> no? Okay. I'm gonna get rid of that. Just so you guys know too, Wolf Steel, like you're probably like, what the hell is Wolf Steel, right? So what's the next, slide. Uh, next slide? Next slide? Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Slow down, Eric. Slow down. Damn it, I have three cups of coffee on the stage. <laughs> <clears throat> so I might talk about something and then it shows up later in the slides. Um, I don't follow notes on the slides and everything like that. It's, it's not how you should present stuff. So I skip through some stuff. So you, you want to do it now, Eric? Go ahead. No, well, no. <laughs> so Wolf Steel uh, is the parent company of Napoleon. Okay, we have two brands. We have Napoleon, we have Continental. Um, the, the company was created by Wolfgang and Ingrid Schroeder. Um, that's where the Wolf Steel came from. Um, Wolfgang migrated from Germany, uh, and Ingrid did as well, and they met in Canada, and then they started Wolf Steel uh, as a company. So we have just over 1.8 million square feet of manufacturing and warehouse internationally. We sell all over the world. I think we're in 29 different countries with grills and HVAC and hard factory up in um, in Barrie, Ontario. Uh, just a couple of the buildings that we have. Um, this one here is our main office, and that's where we build all our HVAC products. So all our furnaces are built in Canada. Okay, they're not built in uh, anywhere else in, in the world. Parts are sourced from Mexico, like any other manufacturer. Vendor motors, control boards, stuff like that. Um, but everything's assembled in Barrie, Ontario. The only uh, hearth products, sorry, the HVAC products we do not manufacture in Barrie is our heat pumps and our mini splits. Everything else is manufactured there. Our air conditioners. Uh, has anybody ever seen, done a factory tour and see how, how uh, the outdoor condensing coil is made? No? So we bring ours in a flat sheet like this, the whole condensing coil, and we have a machine that bends it right on the spot. It's all one total bend, okay? So if you ever get up to the tour with Eric and R.F. Fager, uh, you'll be able to see that on the line. You'll be able to see the furnaces go the down the line, our condo packs, and depending on where else they take you, uh, this back half we build hearth products. Um, this is our R&D area, and then we have a warehouse kind of right here across the street. Um, that warehouse is 280,000 square feet by itself, and it's got like 49 different roll-up doors on it. And it's strictly just warehousing for product coming in and out of the factory. And then we have a couple other ones. Uh, we have a plant down in Kentucky. Um, we also have a couple more plants in Barrie as well. Uh, this is the family that uh, has the, owns the business. So that's Wolfgang and Ingrid. And then their two sons, Chris and Steven, who have now taken over the business because um, Ingrid and Wolfgang have stepped back away from the business. So you'll see the furnaces and that will come as a box and they may say Wolf Steel on them. Um, that's because that's what the parent company is. Is that what you're going to say? Yep. All right. Done. And I'm say too the guy the uh, you know the whole family owned thing. What does that mean to you? Well, you know, coming from you know a couple different spots I was at before, you know, publicly traded, you got so many layers of shit you got to go through to get. You just got to. You guys want a good product to get resolved. You know, if there's any issues. Then mm. layer of it, when when you guys, God forbid, there's something that goes wrong in the field, right? There is a very thin layer of people that we have to go through to make things right. Uh, whereas before, in other uh, you know companies, there's so many layers of approval just to get your customer happy. We'll squash that like, pretty quick, right? It, you know, if there's anything that you know goes really south with the homeowner, okay. So mm -hmm. I just want you to know that, and that's a good thing about a family-owned. We want to squash it quick. Yeah, even, even to that point, um, excuse me, in my role to find out if there's a field issue, so I found a issue um, within, I sent the email out probably 8 o'clock the other night, by 7 o'clock in the morning, we stopped shipping, reviewed to make sure it's safe, right? So overnight, and there's like five or six layers above me, but overnight we're able to stop our shipping out of our warehouse, inspect everything, make sure it's good, and then start shipping again. So all that product's being moved again and being shipped out. So we have good product coming out of the factory right away. So to resolve field issues and also to resolve customer issues and that, it's easy for us to, to work with that process through the company. Okay, so we're gonna go, we're gonna talk about the tools. Um, so how, does, how does the trades work here for refrigeration? Are you guys licensed? Do you need just an EPA? Just EPA. Okay, so how does that work? 
Like for me, I'll give you an example. For me to get my refrigeration license, my commercial license, it's 9,000 hours in the field, three two-month terms at a college, and I gotta write a four-hour exam. And then I'm licensed. So, so how's it work here? It's, it's the, I, the thing is a doctor, you can be a doctor as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I cover all North America, so I'm all over everywhere. So I know it's different everywhere. So just... It's so, the Wild West by comparison. <laughs> okay, all right. I like that. Yeah, all right, just, just so I know. So some of the slides, you may be doing this for a while. Some of them are pretty basic. We talk about vacuum pumps and stuff like that, right? But I, it's developed for anybody and everybody, someone new into the trade, and it's people that have been in it for a long time. But I just like to understand how you guys have your licenses and how that works. So we'll talk about uh, the hybrid system, how it's gonna get installed, um, the arrangements, um, flaring, brazing, and then evacuation and considerations of the units as we go through, okay? So uh, on here we have another QR code. This will take you to the digital assets on our website. So that's where you'll go into our um, dealer portal. You can get support, you can get all spec sheets, manuals for the units, all, all that kind of stuff. Your price and everything is gonna come from our Fagger. Um, so there's no, there's no access to any pricing in there. Uh, if it is, it's just a straight MSRP price that you're gonna see as a price book, right? And then whatever rate you're gonna get from our Fagger as a distributor, you'll get that separately. Um, but in your little handouts, there's the QR codes in there as well. All these slides are on the memory stick as well. Just see, I forget things. Uh, in, the, in that memory stick, you have uh, our flow chart troubleshoot manual for the heat pumps. You have some marketing stuff in there. You have the manual for the air handler, which we'll cover as well. Um, you have, I forget what else I put on. There's nine different documents, we'll just say that, that are on there for you guys for in the field. So copies of all the handouts, so you can share it with people at, the at your office, and then you don't have to carry uh, a pad of paper around in your truck either, and spill your coffee on it, and put it in a milk crate, like where most of your manuals probably are. So this is just a little product overview. This is something that you could download off of that website, and put onto your website, or put a link to it. The Napoleon NS18 series features the videos are different. and air handlers that provide your home with the perfect heating and cooling solution. They not only cool your home in the summer, but provide heat to your home on colder days too. That means your heat pump will act as an air conditioner when things get hot. It will heat your home when it's cold outside. Switch to a Napoleon NS18 for a healthier, cost-effective, and comfortable heating and cooling solution for your home. The outdoor, low-profile heat pumps are ideal for installation anywhere, including narrow spaces. And the Napoleon Air Handler balances a comfortable temperature in your home. Complete with Energy Star rated units featuring a 10-year limited warranty for years of worry-free usage. Get year-round comfort with Napoleon's NS18 series, an all-in-one heating and cooling solution. 100% heat, 100% cool. So that's just a little more here you can download. What you'll find today is we're going to start calling it a WSE number now, not an NS18. Um, everybody knows we're switching refrigerants, the industry is, and everybody knows about CR2 ratings and all that kind of stuff. So when we brought out NS18, it was our CR1. When we switched to CR2, which we have done now, uh, we couldn't use the same name. So we had to call it WSE. It's the exact same product, nothing changed from the NS18 because it still matches with the ratings for SEER 2. So now it's a WSC, and I'll explain how that nomenclature works out now. Um, just so you, uh, if you're out in the field, or you, uh, do you guys still have an NS18s? Four or five times. Yeah, four or five ton NS18s. They're the same as the four or five ton WSEs. Exact same product that does not change. Okay, just so you guys know uh, how that works. So uh, the biggest thing is the SEER and SEER 2 ratings, uh, you can down right so the heat pumps 15 down to 14.3 that's for our standard heat pump okay so everything got stepped down all of our products made sear 2 it just got downgraded a little bit on the sear rating is how our product line went I know some other manufacturers had to basically wipe everything away and start all over again but our product was already designed that would meet the sear 2 ratings uh, and how it's gonna fit together so we've started shipping all the sear 2s some of the manufacturers some of the distributors have sear Sear 1's still out there, but they still meet the Sear 2 ratings. Mm -hmm. And working with Fagger and Eric, and our company, we can get you that change over from Sear 1 to Sear 2 if it matters for a rebate. 
we can we can work that out for you. Um, biggest thing is with heat pumps. Um, there's a big push for everybody going green, right? Um, somebody mentioned, oh, you did it back in the corner in the red shirt. He was at a house and the lady wants to go to the heat pump, but she has no insulation in her house, right? So she doesn't want to put the money in to go green with put insulation in, but she wants the heat pump, right? Uh, the biggest thing is the governments in North America, Canada, and the U.S., and pretty much around the world, they're trying to go to uh, the go green theory, right? By 2037 or, or whenever they decide. Depends if you're in California or not. Um, working with different uh, boards, um, what I found is uh, the boards are saying that most manufacturers are saying in the next 10 years, there will be no air conditioners anymore. Everything will be heat pumps. Right? So the biggest push is... Holy, that's never happened. Hey, shut up. Can you text Shorty and tell him I'm training? That's who that was. So for for the greener home grants, this is for Canada, but you can see we're we're aiming as a country for 2032. Are you laughing at me? Yeah. yeah. No. I, I don't have a, I I don't have an office mouth. If you can't tell, right? Net zero homes, and that's what it is. Do you guys have a big push in this area for net zero homes? No, not yet. No. It'll probably come sooner or later that they're trying to get every house down to net zero so it's just off no carbon footprint, right? That's what it is. Oh, now I screwed that up. So, like I said, the biggest thing is to get away from all, all the carbon products, right? Um, and they're moving out of that direction. So, to, for us to do that, uh, we've, we brought in our heat pump systems. So our heat pumps, um, we have two outdoor units and two indoor units, which have capacities of four units. So what, what we have is the two three ton on the, on the left hand side, this is the four five ton. Now these, because of the inverter technology and the compressors, you can switch between a two ton or a three ton by changing depth switches, or a four or a five ton. The good part about this is your skew count, right? So if you're doing, say, the air handler and the heat pump, that's all you need to carry. Do you guys at your own shops, or do you guys just come here and pick stuff up? How does it work? You guys just come pick stuff up? So our fagger's only carrying these two SKUs, and that does you from two ton, well, actually a ton and a half, up to about five and a quarter, based on the depth switches, okay? Uh, when I first got into the trades 20-odd uh, years ago, uh, we used to do air conditioners by, if you can fit in my thumb, that's the one I'm going to put on in your house, based on what's in the truck, and I'll just keep stepping back across the street until it fits in. We did the same thing with furnaces, right? So we'd have houses that have only need a ton or a ton and a half, and we're putting two and a half tons in there, right? Which we know now is totally, if anything, you should go the other way, right? Because the, the, the tonnage for your dehumidification, the lower your tonnage, the more dehumidification you get. You can do that with this now, right? So you're carrying two SKUs. So if you show up to the house and you have a salesperson and they sell a three ton and you get there as a technician and say, this is only a two ton based on your duct capacity and static pressure and all that stuff, you still have the same unit on your truck. It's easy enough to just switch the dip switches to bring it back down to a two ton, right? Or kind of a two and a quarter ton because we can add a bit more uh, with the dip switches. Versely with your air handler is the same thing. That air handler is for a two, three ton, and this air handler is for a four, five ton. So your SKUs are very narrowed now. You don't have to worry about having multiple units uh, as a lineup. Nomenclature for the uh, air handlers, um, our brand, our product level, so the premium, ultimate, or standard. Uh, this pr standard premium ultimate is based off our furnaces. So we have uh, a single stage furnace, which is our standard, Premium two stage, and then we have one that's uh, our ultimate, which comes with a stainless steel door, fully insulated cabinet, UV lights, LED lights in it, the whole works. And that's our premium. So we do the same thing for here. Um, the model, so air handler, what type of motor, your tonnage, and then revisions and air flows after that. Okay? When we look at the, the heat pump, 
And this is where it used to be NS18. Uh, we changed it to WSE, so it's Wolf side discharge, okay? And then you're into your sear rating, what type it is, the heat pump, variable speed, your tonnage, first stage tonnage, two stage tonnage, and then what gas it's going in. As a manufacturer, we're going to 454 for refrigerants, which most of the manufacturers are going that way, unless you're Daikin and you own half of the refrigeration company and you're buying your own product. Um, they're going to 32, which is the other main refrigerant. I slapped my uh, product manager who came up with that nomenclature. It doesn't roll off a tongue like N18. No. Like, that's a lot. Of, it is. You know, it's a lot. So that's, that's how we, we differentiate, and on the end is your brand. So we, like I said, we run two brands, Napoleon Continental, like Chevy and GM, same thing, right? Uh, in Canada, we have Napoleon as the dealer direct option, and distribution is all continental. Uh, outside of that, um, distributors in the U.S. are all Napoleon. Okay, so that you you won't see the brand um, right now as Napoleon or Continental. It'll just come as Napoleon. Okay. Any question about the nomenclature? No. So your units, um, 24, 36, 48, and 60, which is a 54, um, they are all sear, uh, Energy Star rated. They're all NEEP rated as well. So you have all your ratings on there. AHRI numbers, um, don't take to heart what it says in the slides. Because every day I print these, put these information on the slides, I feel it's out of date because uh, AHRI can just change the number whenever they want. Uh, we are coming out with uh, SKUs so that the heat pump and a coil match can be put on any furnace as well. So that's a whole new AHR number as well. Or you can do it as a combination unit with our furnace or air handler with a heat pump. Okay? I want to mention too, uh, yep. I'm staring at the Energy Star. Yes, no, 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 no. Yeah, the, that's... Uh, the SEER 2 is all yes. It's all yes, no. All completely Energy Star from top to bottom, no matter what the pattern yep. Uh, so the way we make this work with the SKUs is by changing dip switches. Your unit out of the factory comes as a 3-ton or 5-ton respectively. And then we just change dip switches to change it into a uh, 2-4-ton. Right? So as soon as you open up the box, it's a 3-ton or a 5-ton. And then you're just going to switch it down to 2 or 4. So like we said, smaller investment on it, right? warehouse space, and your inventory turnaround is easier because you have less stock. And for you guys, that really doesn't matter. It's more for our fagger for stocking, you know, a ton all the way up to a five-ton unit. They got multiple SKUs there. Right. Yes? Question. So say you have a three-and-a-half-ton perfectly designed system. You want three-and-a-half tons. Are you putting in a three-ton model, or would you recommend the four- or five-ton model? I would go a three-ton model. And, and the reason is, um, if you go four tons, you're losing your dehumidification, right? So air conditioning always dehumidifies first. If you overton on your cooling capacity, you're gonna still have lots of moisture in the house. It's not gonna, it's gonna feel damp and sticky. I just didn't know if your four would go a little bit lower than four, or does the three, will it go a little bit higher than three? A bit of both, right? So when we get into dip switches, there is an energy savings mode, which deregulates the compressor speed and slows it down, but not enough to help you on a three and a half. Right? I would rather have the unit work a little harder and dehumidify first, make sure all that moisture content's gone, and then carry over. Because uh, we do have uh, a mode we can turn it up a little bit and speed the compressor up. We've been installing the volume for the better part of a year now. Haven't ran into that situation yet. Mm -hmm. So once we cross that bridge, it's, it's nice to know what's recommended. Yeah, I would always go down just because I want that dehumidification to happen first. Right? So my house I bought. Before COVID, they put a, a two-ton, yeah, it's a two-ton air conditioner in there. I have about four, about 600 square feet of living space. It's a one-bedroom ranch style, no basement, no second floor, nothing like that. Uh, it took me um, probably eight months to get the moisture off the windows because they oversized the air conditioner. So I took it out, I threw the heat pump in there, uh, and I don't have a problem now, right? Because I can slow things down with the heat pump, right? So if you oversize it, you're gonna run into that moisture problem. 
right? Thank you, sir. So with the unit heat pump, so what that means is when you look at the cooling, uh, the heating capacities, you're going down to minus five at 100 percent and minus uh, 22 Fahrenheit, you're at 78 percent. What's the lowest you guys are getting around for temperatures down here? Yeah. So this is gonna. If you do this with uh, electric back or whatever, you're not gonna ever kick it down to the bottom. So for where I live, I live um, Erie, Pennsylvania. Go right across the lake. You hit London, Ontario, which is in the. I'm right there, right in the southern tip. So I'm an hour and a half from Detroit. Um, we'll talk about thermostats with the switching table. So I have a, a natural gas furnace and a heat pump. My furnace didn't fire all winter. It ran off the heat pump the whole time. Right? I don't get a lot of snow. You guys probably get more snow than what I get because of the way it comes off the lakes and that, right? But you'd be hard pressed to have this thing shut down during the winter and, and not heat the house properly. Right? Senator, you and I were in New York doing this uh, kind of a class. Um, there was a contractor who installed four hybrid systems. It was our four pot hunters, our, our double stack. Um, all north of Rochester, you run into uh, Lake Ontario. Um, and he said that this past winter, uh, that furnace only kicked on five times the whole entire winter with the four pot hunter. And up there, right on the lake, uh, it, was, it was during that polar vortex during that Christmas week. It was the only time the backup uh, furnace kicked on. So, no, no heat strips in those units? In the air handlers, you select your heat strip. You can add a heat strip. Five did, like, did they have heat strips? Or was no, it they had a, a furnace. Oh, so like this? the furnace was their backup? Correct. Okay. Yep, yep. So the furnace only kicked on like uh, five, five, six days the whole entire winter up there. So it's it's pretty good. I know we got some propane guys in here. Uh, so. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. That's it, you guys didn't do that. It, yeah, but, yeah. Mm. But it, it, these, these things would really work. But you can set the setting as well, though. You know, if the homeowner doesn't like that heat pump heat, you know, it's, it comes across the skin a little cool. Yeah, yeah. The the heat pump heat's very different compared to uh, a fuel heat, right? Especially anybody do oil? Yeah, oil is very different than propane and natural gas, right? I put a, a Toro and oil furnace on my mother-in-law's house, put in a propane, sorry, natural gas, and she's like, it's cold in here. No, the thermostat's the same thing. Right? Yeah. You just got to get used to it because it feels different, right? It's a solid fuel heat. Yeah. Uh, what's defrost time on this? How long? Customers ask me all the time. I don't know how long it takes defrost cycle. So it depends on how much defrost time you need out of it. Usually around 15 minutes. That's usually what I tell them. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so, so with the inverter technology, um, we have a great ability to bring that ratio down and how it works. The other good thing about this unit here is um, it has an accumulator in, into the system. Uh, everybody know what an accumulator is? Anybody that don't? There's an easy way to explain it. I'll explain it anyways. Think of a two-liter pop bottle and put a straw in it. That's your accumulator, right? That's the easiest way to explain it. What it does is holds all the extra refrigeration, refrigerant in your system that you don't need, and when you need it, it pulls it out of there. So what that does for us technicians, no more adding refrigerant. Sorry, or sorry, removing refrigerant if the line sets short. That accumulator, that pop bottle is going to hold the extra refrigerant for you until you need it. And if you don't need it, it just sits in there. It cycles through and moves by itself. Right? So these units, we'll talk about what they're good for. If we have a 15-foot line set, we don't have to remove refrigerants. We don't have to pull it out of the system. It can stay in there for us. So less time putting gauges on these units. Um, <coughs> the other thing is, you don't have to do superheat or subcool on here either because this compressor, we have no way to lock out the frequency. This is an inverter, so we don't have to worry about doing subcool or superheat on here, right? So the accumulator picks up the extra refrigerant and we don't have to worry about doing subcool or superheat. Uh, warranty, like I said in the video on that, 10 years, parts and labor, that's if it's registered. Everybody register their products? You should, because if not, that changes to a five-year warranty. Um, I had uh, a customer call me that I knew and said, I have a Napoleon furnace and now I got to get a new furnace because the uh, motor went on it because nobody registered the warranty on it.
if it was registered, they would have got a free motor and everything, and they went with a different, uh, got a new furnace because of it. Well, I just want to retract one thing. I think you might have squeezed in the word labor. No, oh, no, ten years. Oh, yeah. All right. No yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Clarify it. Yeah. Retract. Clarify what I said then. Because. What What did I say? So just ten year, ten year parts. Ten year parts. Yeah. Not, not labor. Yeah, ten years parts. So labor will go if you do a labor contract for these guys. Okay. Right. This is why I have these guys everywhere where I go. So ten years parts. Any questions? No? All right, we'll give you a, yeah. So you said you, you don't have to take two previous cases. Nope. Are you, are you able to see it somehow through the unit? Because I know that the Bosch unit, you can see two previous cases without putting gauges on it. No. Does this work the same way? You no. Know, you don't nope. ever have to You don't ever have to worry about it. Nope. Yeah, so in the, in, in the troubleshoot manuals, it goes through all the pressure ranges and that for you. So you know if you're good on pressures and that, right? It also, the system also has a low cutoff and high cutoff pressure um, sensors on it. So it's able to pick that up for you, right? And gives you the lockout code on the screen and says low pressure, right? Okay. So this is kind of where it gets a little basic with some of the tools, but we kind of got to go through it. So basic tool meter. Um, Manifold gauges, a vacuum pump, and then you're going to need Allen wrenches, a scale, if you're adding refrigerant, you're going to need this adapter. That's that little 5 16 adapter you're going to use for many of that, and you probably have three or four in your tool bag in your truck, and you can't find it, sort of like that 10 mil socket, all right? <laughs> He's pointing at somebody already. Uh, you're going to need that adapter to connect to the system, okay? So installation of the product, uh, we'll go through a look appliance weight and drainage on the unit. So the air handler is a, a three position air handler. So you can do up flow, left or right. Okay, there is no down flow option on the air handler. Um, 10 years warranty on the, uh, the parts once it's registered. No labor. No labor, that's right, no labor. You guys heard that, right? No labor. I, I was in British Columbia last week and the distributor there does labor and sometimes it gets all stuck in my head. No, yeah, well, we'll, that's if we, we'll give you $65 to the manufacturer. So if there's an issue on the manufacturing side, we'll give you $65 labor to fix something. Um, not really. Still applies to the heat pumps, right? But that's outside of the, the, the warranty and stuff like that, right? So, you know, we, we'll cover the $65 if it's a warranty thing for us, right? Uh, so inside the unit, this is for both units, the... Two three ton or the four five ton air handler. Uh, this is the basic layout. So you got electrical box, uh, the fan motor, uh, evaporated coil, primary and secondary drain. It's set up for left horizontal. Um, to change it over to a right horizontal, just slide the case coil out, and then sl switch the pan to the right hand side. Um, so it has both pans already in it. You don't have to buy a separate pan to do that. The one thing to note on this air handler is uh, these right here. What are those? Yeah, king valves. This coil in the air handler is charged with refrigerant. Okay, not with nitrogen, not with dry air. It's refrigerant. So when you vac this down, you're gonna have king valves at the outdoor unit and the indoor unit. You need to vac down each line individually. Okay, if you do not, and you open those king valves, you're gonna have non-condensables in your refrigerant. That means you need to take all the refrigerant out of the system. Throw it in a re uh, reclaimed jug, give it back to somebody, and weigh in all new refrigerant, which you're about 10 pounds, just so you have an idea. All right, that coil holds uh, 0.55 pounds of refrigerant by itself. Okay, um, so make sure you actually vac down both sides. Uh, I did a training with Eric before, and the owner of the company said, "Oh, we had a problem," and then he called me back where we finished wrapped up the training and said, "What do I do now?" I'm like, it's easy. Reclaim all the refrigerant, throw it away, and weigh in all new refrigerant. He didn't realize the, the king valve that we're talking about now. So he had to install, having a, a whole bunch of problems with it, you know, and was wondering why. And, and then after this class, 
Um, he's like, he came to us after class, like, oh my god. Yeah. I didn't realize that one. He, he uses manual as an e-pad. No. Yeah, so the, they're king valves, right? Versely, I uh, had another contractor call me one day and say, hey, I keep on going off on pressures. Low pressure or high pressure, depending on which cycle I'm running into. I'm like, yeah, did you open the, all the four king valves open? He goes, there's more king valves? Same thing, right? So the refrigerant's only going so far to the king valve, not going through the cycle. All right, so you got to be very cautious that you're opening them and actually opening them at the right time. And these, are, these king valves are designed to be fully seated. So there's other manufacturers who do king valves where they fully seat them back, they back seat them, and then you roll them forward a bit after you set the system up. These ones are always fully back seated, all right? They're all the way out. Because if you leave them partially, you'll notice when you take the cap off, there'll be oil inside the cap. That means... Okay? Uh, top left-hand corner, you see those three knockouts? That's going to be for your electric backup. And we'll go through there. Uh, in your, on your memory stick, there is a, a little pamphlet on how to do electric backup, okay? It shows only a 5, 8 kilowatt, 10 kilowatt backup. If you do a 15 or 20 kilowatt backup, you need a single point entry kit for your power. Okay? Does everybody know what a single point entry kit is? Yeah? Yes? No? Yeah? We're good? Okay? Because you're going to need that for that system. It's not provided with the electric backup at this time. I'm working on it. So dimensions uh, between the units, 24 and the 36 and the 4860. Uh, biggest things is your width and then your height. Now, uh, Eric taught me a new word is a scuttle. They use scuttles here too, Eric? Uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of them. Your attic hatch, right? Going up into attic, you guys are putting these in an attics? I'd never heard scuttle until he told me. Um, these are one single unit. They do not split in half, so make sure you have enough clearance in your attic hatch. Uh, to get that unit up into the attic, okay? Um, I ran into one contractor since we talked about that where they had to actually cut the hole bigger and they had to put like a three foot hole in the ceiling to get it up and back down. So that's just a good survey when you sell the system, right? So you can always make the return bigger. That's usually what we do. Yeah. yeah. You make the return bigger and get up through the return hole? You never go wrong with that, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you guys do a lot of attic installations? Yes. Do you? Yeah. More than I'd like to. Yeah, so in my area we in my area we do none. There's no attic insulations. Right? It's crawl space or a basement or like a mechanical room on the main floor. No attics. <coughs> but we also have, you know, two weeks of uh about minus ten Fahrenheit, two weeks straight. Right? So we don't want nothing in the attic, it's just gonna freeze. Right? So here's your backups. Um you'll find in there uh, in, on that memory stick as well, there's a, a letter stating that you can put uh, a 15 kilowatt in a 3 ton. Uh, originally when we brought these out, when they were SEER 1s, just the SEER ratings, it was not approved for a 15 kilowatt in a 3 ton. We got it retested with uh, ANSI and uh, CSA and UL to get the uh, 15 kilowatt in the 3 ton. All right. So in the manuals on all the new units, you'll see that it has that. But if you get a, an older air handler from the SEER ratings, it may say you're not allowed to have that in there that letter's in there for you to say yes you are. Okay, so that's on the memory stick there for you as well. And this is where you're gonna need that single point entry kit for those uh, because you got two breakers for the electric backups. So clearances, uh, basically applications for clearances. Um, service is 24 inches, like a furnace for front access. That's so we can actually get the blower out and get the coil out so we can service the product, okay? Um, just uh, as an FYI, furnaces do not require a 24 inch clearance based on the product. It's all based on service. I don't know if it's going to be the same in the US, but in Canada they're actually trying to push that for 36 inches now. So you have to have a door access in front or 36 is in front. Um, vertical insulation, we already talked about that. Uh, airflow, you guys are doing actually ductwork, tin ductwork, or board ductwork? Both. Okay. Um, you'll find when we go through these units, they're all based off static pressures, right? So you really got to look at your static pressures to figure out what your static is on the ductwork to make sure your fan speeds are set up properly on their uh, air handlers. Uh, horizontal insulation. The only thing I like to have this up for is for one thing only, 
wherever you put your rods, make sure you don't put them in front of your access doors. Um, or you'll be up in the attic trying to jack them up and take and stuff like that. So with our units, with our heat pumps, you have the ability to pair it with our furnace as well. And now for any other furnace out there in the market, because we have the new numbers coming, um, our case coils are designed to fit on top of our furnaces. And depending on the application, so if you do a 9600, for instance, which is the furnace in the back corner there, we'll look at later, that's tied in the system, that's a four position furnace. So you can do up, left, right, and down. Okay. Match up to that so you can tie that system in there. If you're using a secondary system, you may need to have a coil adapter, right? Or a plenum adapter, whatever terminology you want to use. Are you guys doing case coils or are you guys just doing regular A coils? Case? Majority of case? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's funny. In Ontario, 98% of it's uh, A coil. Yeah. Uncased. Just a regular uncased coil. But majority of our contractors have their own sheet metal shop too, right? So you're building all that stuff in house. Outdoor units. This is the 2436. Uh, two big things you'll notice here is B and I get the right number here uh, C are your two dimensions that are going to be different, okay? Uh, be between that and then between uh, the 48 and 60. So your 48, 60 is a little narrower on the units compared to 24, 36. Then of course your height's different um, based on that's a double stack unit. So there's two fans on the 48, 60 and only one on the 24, 36. Um, dimensions. So because this is a side discharge unit, and depending on what operation we are in, we need to make sure we have airflow going both ways. Uh, eight, minimum eight inch clearance on the back side of the units from bushes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we have clearances on there. This is all in the manual. I'm not gonna bore you with the clearances. Um, the one thing I am gonna talk about is right here. If you do uh, stack units, so if one on top of the other, you need to make sure you install the drain kit okay on the upper units and we'll talk about the drain kit in the next couple slides we want that drain kit installed so the moisture you do defrost and that does not leak on top of the units that's below okay pretty pretty common sense um, but I only say it because it's happened right no one's done it um, so we get that moisture off the top of that unit so it doesn't ice up on top of the units okay um, are you guys using wall brackets or do you guys use stands to put your heat pumps on the ground 50? Okay. All right. Um, the rule of thumb in the industry is 18 inches off the ground for a heat pump. Are you guys doing that? Or do you guys put them flat on the ground on slabs? Stands? Okay. You're getting them off, off the ground? Yeah. The, the 18 inches is really based on your climate as well. Um, the rule of thumb is 18 inches because of snow load. So if you look at a furnace manual, how far do your furnaces got to be off the ground? 18 inches. Right, so that carries over for snow load for 18 inches off the ground. But if you're using um, those platform cones or, or stand like that, with your snow load, you guys are probably going to be fine where you are, right? <coughs> so just be cautious on where you are. We want it out of the snow so it doesn't freeze into the units, right? So it can drain properly in defrost mode. Uh, if it does not drain properly and we get moisture in the bottom of the pan, once it turns into ice, it'll stay ice until the season's done. And if it stays that way, you actually crush, crush the refrigeration lines inside the units, okay? For the heat pumps? Yeah. Yes. They do. Yeah, they do. And we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, here, we're here already. So the heat, the heat strip, right, is only on from this side right here, that way. Okay. So in this back corner here is your compressor and everything. There's no heat strip. And what we found is, and we're working with uh, the manufacturing to change it, is in this back corner right here, so that corner there, we can see if we open up that unit, um, there's a depression in the pan right here. There's no drain hole there. So we've had a few in, in the West, in Western Canada, where they've built up some ice 
and it's actually crushed the lines going into the coil, right? So what I tell everybody is, in that corner when you go to install that, take a 3 8 step bit and drill a hole, right? So there's, there's another drain there. So I'm working with the engineers to redesign the pan so there's a drain hole there. Because currently, there's no drain hole. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there, there's one in the center, right? So you get drain plugs. If you're putting it on a stand or on your, your pads that you raise it up by, I don't install any of those drain plugs. I want it to drain as much as possible, so I leave all the plugs out. The only time I put the plugs in and I use this drain adapter, which is actually a 90 degree adapter now, so it comes out and goes 90 right away with the barb fitting, I only use this application when I stack one unit on top of the other. Other than that, I want to drain as much as possible to get rid of all that moisture that's in that unit. Okay? So like I said, we've had a couple that got crushed. In the manual, it says put the unit level when you mount it. Um, what's level to everybody? Be between the lines, right? Yeah. yeah. It was touching the edge of the line on the right-hand side on a two-foot level and on the right-hand side on a one-foot level. So it was leaning a little bit back to that back corner and that's why the guy had ice built up in that corner, right? So put that little hole in the bottom of that spot and if you do anything, make it slope forward a little bit, right? So we don't get water in there. So to the front and a little bit to the left and then you won't have that problem, okay? But yeah, that electric uh, pan heater is only in this side over here, okay? Any questions about drainage and stuff like that? No? So pressure and installation. So when you guys do your line sets, are you buying um, pre-insulated line sets? Or do you insulate them yourself? And are you insulating both lines? You should, you should insulate both lines. So this system we'll talk about later is 3 quarter and 3 eighths. The recommendation is you lines. The reason behind that is you're using energy to build heating or cooling, depending on your application. You're wasting it when you don't insulate both lines. Right? So whatever that distance is, you're wasting that energy you've worked hard to build in the system. So we recommend you insulate both lines. And I know it's, it's hit and miss depending on where I go. Some places do it, some places don't. Um, but the recommendation is you're already doing that energy to build that energy in heating or cooling capacity. You want to absorb as much as you can and not dissipate in the house. Because you imagine your line set's going through the house and say you have a, a 20 foot line set, there's probably only maybe four feet of line set outside out of that. So you got 16 feet of line set inside and you're, you're have heat coming through those refrigeration lines and you're dumping it back in the house because it's going to radiate off of there. So if you insulate, you're actually carrying that transfer outside where you want it to be. Okay, so we want both lines in, uh, insulated. Um, nitrogen, does everybody purge everything with nitrogen when you braise? Okay. Uh, flares, so these uh, units are flare fittings. So if you use the air handler, it's flare connection and the outdoor unit's flare connection. If you use a case coil, it's a brace connection, okay? So what we have done is, uh, we were selling these separately, and now they're included with every unit. So you have uh, flex connectors. So they're flare to brace, right? Fl flare to sweat. These will get you outside of your cabinet. If you go out to the front or out to the right. I'm working on extending them probably another, I think it's 12 inches. So they'll actually get you out of the back side of the unit as well. So when we look at the knockouts, you'll see what I'm talking about. These now come with the outdoor units. You can buy them separately, so you could actually do it on the indoor coil as well. And just do uh, 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 flare to flare and just braise this on. Uh, or if you do pro press or whatever you, you do, you could set that system up that way as well. Okay, but they do now come with the units. Um, you got to make sure you deburr everything because if not, your burr will stop your uh, flare nut from seating properly. Okay? Um, do not recommend putting on, uh, I always forget the name of it, the blue thread stuff. Um, Loctite. Yeah, Loctite. Or do not put it on the system. If you put anything on it, put on vacuum oil. Okay? If you put vacuum oil on your flares and on your threads, it'll actually stop the nut from binding and help it seat and create a seal. Okay, we do not want any of that stuff. Um, we do not want it in the system. 
There is certain Loctite stuff that's designed not to damage the oil and the compressor and everything, but we do not want it in the system, okay? These units already have um, a filter dryer on them, built into the system. If you're brazing, we recommend you to put another filter dryer on there externally, okay? Because we do not want any of the particles when you braze get picked up into the main filter dryer. The main filter dryer is back inside the compressor area of that unit. And I can tell you, if I ever have to cut one out, I'm brazing in a piece of copper. I'm not brazing in another filter dryer. So I want a secondary one on the outside. So you can do a secondary filter dryer that's uh, flared or braze, whatever you want. It has to be a bi-directional filter dryer. Okay? So standard filter dryer normally is one direction. Okay? We need a bi-directional because it's a heat pump. Refrigeration goes in both directions. Now, for your case coils, is that just the using a unique direction for that? Yeah. Okay. Are the EUVs in the outdoor unit on these? Is that not an issue if you're they are. the dryers after your EUV? They are. It's not an issue uh, the way the system's set up. Okay. So you can put it in line. Okay. Yeah. For the rest of the okay. We just want to pick up all the particles and everything, right? So if you. Um, if you've ever seen, that's what it looks like when you don't use nitrogen through your copper lines when you brace. So if you're brazing, you're not using nitrogen, that's what you're going to end up looking like inside. And all that's going to pull off, and most likely it's going to plug your main filter dryer that's inside the units. It's going to plug it up pretty quick, and that's why we want that secondary filter dryer. So hopefully it picks it up first. Okay, so if you're installing in the summer mode, right, Look and see where you're going to put your filter dryer. Most likely you can get away with a 3 8 filter dryer either way, right? Because we can run the cycle right away in both directions. It's going to pick up any, anything going on in there. So nitrogen, however you guys braze with nitrogen, um, I have an old glass tube. Looks like a medical tube off, of a, uh, off a tank with a little bulb inside. I guess there's new ones you can turn on a dial. It says purge or, or unpurge or whatever. Uh, whatever you want to do. Um, brazing uh, with nitrogen is one of those things, there's a couple different ways of doing it. I've seen people where they do one braze at a time and they cap the end as, as they work. I fit it all together and let nitrogen leak out wherever it's going to as I braze along, right, to keep it cool. So depending on how you do it, you just want to make sure you want to get that nitrogen through there so it's brazed properly and protected. Any questions about that? No? If you're doing flares, you don't have to even worry about brazing or run nitrogen through there other than your pressure test. So line sets. This system, it doesn't matter what size, if you're two ton or five ton, you're three quarter and three eighths for your line set. You do not have to ups upsize your copper. Um, you have 100 feet. Um, maximum height is uh, 50 feet going straight up, okay, for your heights. If you're going above, the rule of thumb is 18 feet you need, or going below 18 feet, you need to put in oil traps, okay? If you're doing a unit higher 18 feet, you're going to put that oil trap in there. And if you're going, and so the heat pump's on the roof, you need a reverse bend oil trap at the top, a non-return bend, and then one of, uh, as you're 18 feet coming down, and one at the bottom. This is all about oil management. If your compressor runs out of oil, as you guys know, it's going to fry your compressor, okay? If you do this application here, up on a roof, and you do not put that uh, bend at the top, and you'll never get return. Okay, so you need that reverse bend at the top. Now you can bend that yourself, or you can buy them pre-bent, whatever you want. Okay, I would assume most likely you guys are probably bending them yourselves, with a set of two benders and not buying them. Okay, you only need one line set with bends in it. You do not need both. Okay, so you can choose if you want to do it on your three quarter or your three eighths. All right. Any questions? That. Um, yeah. Right there. No, we haven't got there yet. You didn't miss anything. Yeah, we'll get there. Uh, so those are the thrower adapters I was talking about. Right. Uh, like I said, they come with the unit strap on the outside of the outdoor unit now but you can get it for the indoor unit as well. Uh, we already talked about oil on the threaders. So your torque settings. So it is required, quote unquote required, that you have a torque wrench and torque these down. 
Okay, so there's your torque settings. In the manual, it tells you what the settings are. Uh, who actually torques these down? A few? Yeah. Uh, when I got started doing, uh, years ago I used to do, when they brought in the Zuba units for Mitsubishi, if anybody's familiar with those, they were the first ones to say you had to torque everything. And I had a job and the guy came to the job because we had issues with the units, and he goes, where's your torque wrench? So I had to go down to the hardware store, buy a torque wrench, I bought claw foots because the refrigeration torque wrenches weren't around yet, right? Um, I know manufacturers, uh, dealers in Ontario, they only have one torque wrench for the whole shop. So what they're doing is they're torquing these on at the shop and then letting the guys braze out in the field. So it saves from having multiple torque wrenches, but it is required for you to have a torque wrench uh, to torque these down. So you have the torque settings. Any questions about that? Am I going too fast? No? Okay. Refrigeration lines, we talked about being insulated, both uh, 3 eighths and 3 quarter. Standard uh, length, 25 feet, is, is kind of the standard. Maximum 31 feet. Now that maximum 31 feet is based on you having the air handler and having the outdoor unit match. Okay? So you have 31 feet of copper. If you're using a case coil or just a, a regular A coil, that depletes the distance because your coil, so an ADP coil for instance, is filled with dry air or nitrogen, right? So that 31 feet's already taking in the fact that your air handler has refrigerant in it. Okay, so you need to look at what your coil is, subtract whatever that refrigerant is out of your 31 feet. Okay? And add for that application. Okay? The air handler, like I said, is 0.55 pounds of refrigerant. I know it has more passes than the ADP coil. So it's going to hold a bit more refrigerant. But because we have the accumulator, right, you could probably bet on that 0.55 pounds of refrigerant for an ADP coil as a ballpark. All right? So just be cautious on that distance is based on the coil already being pre-charged with refrigerant. Okay? If you're adding refrigerant, you're 0 0.03 uh, ounces per foot if you need to add into that system. All right? So if you're going to a longer line set, that's what you need to add in there. So vacuums, to vacuum down the system, what are you guys running your vacuum pumps down to in microns? 500? 500. Okay. And how do you know if you have a leak? You don't get a hole? Yeah, a thousand, right? So if you're over a thousand, if it creeps up over a thousand, you have a leak, right? So within 10 minutes, if it goes over a thousand, you got a leak. I personally bring mine down to 250, and I, I aim for 750, right? Because I like a little buffer, but that's me personally. We want 500, and it, if it's over 1,000, you, you have a leak in the system. Now, when you guys run your vacuums, do you guys do a vacuum test on your vacuum pump and your gauges before you put it on the system? No? So do you just take it and shut it off and do a vacuum test to make sure everything holds? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, and just to see if your system's holding, right? Before you tie it in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, everybody's using an actual micron gauge. Uh, when I got in the trades, it was uh, two long Demorier smokes, and that was enough for a vacuum pump. Or your vacuum pump stopped spitting out moisture at the top, you were good then too. But like we were talking yesterday, uh, R22 at the time was, if it's beer can cold, you got enough, enough of a cycle going on too, right? Um, which we can't do that with 410A or anything else coming forward. So we want a good vacuum on the system is the, is the point, right? Make sure it's vacuumed down and make sure that you're holding that micron uh, below 1,000. 1,000 below. Okay, so it's a good held system. Any questions about the basic installation application of it? Yes. Um, do you know, like on the blower chart, with the like with the dash, like if I read the static press? This is the problem when you give out handouts too soon. He's way ahead of us. Oh, sorry. No, that's all right. Go ahead. I mean, you're gonna go over that later. On. Yeah, I will. It's all right. Ask. Um, is like what? What are the ramifications of being in that range? Like, is the blower gonna fail? If you're above, out of the you're static range. If you're like in these dash ranges, like on yeah. The so if you're out of the range, wherever there's a dash, 
A um, couple different options. It, it, it can sound like a freight train, right? Or if you're low on static pressure, you're not getting enough airflow, you'll feel no pressure out, right? So eventually, you can burn out the motor if you're out of that range. Yeah, but ultimately, your static pressure is so high, it's going to sound like a freight train running down there, right? And if, so if, if you're too low, it would be just not enough airflow? Yeah, it'll be really soft in general out of the thing. You won't feel much pressure, right? And the system will operate properly or efficiently? No. Okay. That's right. Yeah, so we want to be in that. That fit range. Sorry, with, the, with, the, uh, with the Gen 2, Generation 2 air handlers that are out in the field now, will they, because uh, I know the, the Generation 1 air handlers, the motors, they were really sensitive, and if you went beyond static pressure, I want to say beyond uh, 0.8 or something, yeah, it would shut. It, would sh it shuts the system, system. yeah, it, would shut it overheats the motor and shuts down. So it would overheat and it would shut the motor off, right? So I think the they're, they're better. But will it still, if, they're, if it's way outside... It'll still shut down. It'll still shut down? Yeah. Because it's overworking on the motor. Have heard when, if anybody had anyone shut down, uh, if it's beyond one? Yeah, no, I haven't heard of any with the Gen 2 shutting down. Gen 1's, we, there was an issue with them shutting down because it got so so heated, right? That's just the thermal limits to the Thermal limits. The no, thermal limits in the motor. Oh, okay. So eventually it did so many times, the thermal limit was shot and the motor was shot. Right, the Gen 2s have a better thermal limit in there, um, but I can't say it's going to shut down. If you go to level four, uh, sorry, level eight, and it was only supposed to be a level six, it's going to shut down. We haven't run into that, but you're you're over exercising the motor. So the motor is what it's supposed to do. Yeah. People think, hey, this piece of crap keeps shutting off. Well, it's telling you something. Yeah. Compensate something, right? So expand your ductwork, redo your, your create another run. You might Contact need more return. Going into homes where the original ductwork is still there, you're still trying to adapt to a trunk like that when it was like, you know, uh, a belt driven <laughs> unit. In yeah. Now Just these ECMs are a little bit more finicky, so you really got to pay attention and add in those costs. Just to make sure that these ECMs are, can accommodate that, that crappy ductwork you guys are getting into. So, still got to do the right thing. You know, you want to save, save the homeowner money. You know, and the homeowner doesn't understand airflow, that's your job to be a part of that educator at the kitchen table, right, to, to, to make that extra money make sense. Otherwise, you might lose the bid, and the next idiot's going to come in and use that same duct work, and the system's not going to work. So it's okay to just, you know, give them that education, right, so they know what they're spending their money on. Good airflow, freight train, so their curtains aren't flying everywhere. That's part of the education, part of the class that you got to give at the kitchen table. So... So in case your bid's a little bit higher than the other guy, they're going to know why. So you're doing it right, right? So yeah, you you've all been in those houses where the ductwork fires up, the furnace, the furnace or air handle fires up, and you hear it, it's really really loud. And that's what I mean by a freight train, right? It's yeah, it's whistling. There's lots of noise. The cur the curtains are blowing, yeah. right? Um, I've never used ductboard. Uh, we still use all sheet metal. And like even I set up my sheet metal shop and I make my own ductwork. I used to have a duct beater that actually beaded the ductwork instead of cross breaking it, right? Um, you'll see it balloon out, right? I wouldn't be surprised if, if the stack's bad enough, you know, your foot there is going to start splitting seams, right? So you want that to be a quieter system, right? Um, so you got to make sure the air flows proper for it so it flows properly. Um, my area, a lot of farmhouses, and there's only one return in the old, old farmhouses, right? They're at the bottom of the stairs. So then you got to start adding more returns, right? The, they come off and put in like six feet of duct and tie rated in big 24 by 24 return in the floor. Well, that was great for gravity fed furnaces and everything like that, but for what we do now with equipment, it's a terrible idea, right? So you're snaking duct work up through closets to the second floor or making bulkheads in the corner and stuff like that. So we get the proper airflow coming back. Right? So it's really based on designs. When you guys do um, a retro, do you guys have to pull a permit and do a duct design or anything like that? No? Okay. My area, I don't either, right? I don't have to do that. But like when I was in British Columbia, they have to pull permit for every job and they got to do heat loss, heat gain, and duct design for every replacement. So if they do a retro, they got to do all that work to get it certified. So they got to redesign all that stuff. Mine? I don't have to do that, right? So really based on application and, and how you guys figure out your duck runs, right? 
So when you guys do duct runs, how do you figure out how much, how much, uh, what size of ductwork you need for for a new furnace, stuff like that? How do you guys duculator? Yeah. So you're based on your CFM. You're rolling it in and figure it out, right? And and that will give you your duct size, right? So you're betting on probably 70 or 80 CFM for a six inch run, right? Running off of that, and then you're going to size that, right? And run that way, right? When I got in it, the rule of thumb was take all your runs, multiply by 1.5, and that'll give you your main trunk size by eight inches. And then if you actually do the calculation, you're going to hit right where the duculator is, right? So if you have 12 runs, multiply by 1.5, that'll give you your duct work on your supply side by eight inches and by whatever the width is. And once you take a few runs off, you do it again. Same as a duculator, right? And your return, you add four to it, right? So if your, your supply is 20 by eight, your return is going to be 24 by 10 at your main drop spot. That's how I used to do it, quick and easy. And, th and this, is, this is where we kind of caught some of, not caught, but like uh, work with you guys, some of the contractors in the field where when they call in a tech support, they're going out go back a, a, a few times for issues. Um, you know, so when we do that mirror me, when yeah. we send you a link and, you know, sometimes you, you might just need another set of eyes maybe because there are some instances where there wasn't enough return, um, you know, yep. causing the unit to ask weird, act, act terrible, but uh, there wasn't enough runs. So just maybe have another set of eyes on it. We helped, you know, solidify that because the, the unit was running like shit. So, mm -hmm. you know, well, you that's where it helps to a furnace for instance I see they got a, a bunch of uh, bottom return boxes they sell here right when do you have to do two returns on a furnace or a bottom return basically every manufacturer is the same 1800 CFM right you need to put two returns so left and right uh, left and a bottom right and the bottom or just a bottom to get enough airflow these are the best things to do to do that right the, the bottom returns and you don't have to worry about anybody ever try to do a return off the left and right on a furnace? No? Have fun with that wire, your electrical wire, and your drain. Because the filter racks are going to cover both of them. So you need a filter rack on both sides, right? So you end up tapping them outside of the back side of the box or different things like that, right? So these work awesome for that application because it doesn't mess with all, any of those outlets. So static's all based on what your design is. That was a bit of a rabbit hole. All right, <laughs> electrical. So indoor units, this is without the electric backup. Okay, this is just the unit by itself. A 15 amp breaker that you're gonna put in there um, for your, your systems. Outdoor units, um, 2436, 4860. And now this is based on your local code as well, right? So then you also have to look and see what size of wire you already had to go to existing system. You may have to upgrade that wire too, right? Based on the amp draw. And what wires required by your local code. Are you guys allowed to do the wiring or do you guys have to bring electricians in? You guys do the wiring? <coughs> now, are you guys allowed to take a service out of a panel or do you have to bring an electrician in? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so in my in, in my area this is the worst part. I'm on camera now. They're going to record it. In my area, um, if uh, existing service is already there and there's a disconnect, I can do the work. So if there's a breaker in the panel, I can do it. No problem. I'm not technically allowed to add a new circuit in, but we do this. We do it too. Last time I had the cold meter base, the wiresman was there to put the tag back on. Gave me six of them. Said here, <laughs> I need to do this for the tag. Wow. <laughs> but you you pull the whole meter base, right? Yeah, so uh, uh, we're not allowed to pull meter bases, right? Oh, you don't say. Yeah, and, and we don't get the tags. Um, but I can put a new breaker in a panel and stuff like that, right? That's what I mean. So if there's not a breaker existing in that panel, or it needs like a pony panel, for instance, yeah. I got to bring an electrician in for that. I'm, I'm supposed to, right? So it really depends where, where I am. It's kind of hard to come across a 35 amp breaker a lot of times. Yeah. So if they have a 30 amp in there now. Yeah, so the minimum is 24, right? That's your mins. Okay. So you're going to come up with a 30 and a 40. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's just saying that's the maximum protection. So you can't go to a 40 and a 50. Right. I right? Yep. Okay. So this is your range 24 to 35. So the, you're, you you're going to come with a 30 and you're going to come with a 40. Yeah, absolutely. I can't even get 35s or 45s. Right? This is where our engineers come in and say, oh, that's the maximum you're allowed. Right. It just makes it confusing. 
right application basis, I'm only coming with a 30 and a 40. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Wiring for your equipment. So when you wire to an air handler, it's pretty straightforward. Right, all the wires go out, your defrost goes out and everything. When you wire it into a furnace, uh, we do not use the defrost. Okay, so this means your furnace is not going to fire when the defrost mode comes in. Okay, so you're not going to get that airflow or nothing out of that unit. The reason being is, if you look at the national codes for Canada and the U.S., it's the same. You are not allowed to fire uh, a fuel appliance with a refrigeration cycle happening at the same time above it. So basically, when your case coils above your furnace, doesn't matter if it's propane, gas, or oil, and you're in defrost mode, is that in a refrigeration cycle? Yeah. yeah, you can boil off the refrigerant. Right? So especially if we're going to more propane-based refrigerants, it's a bigger issue. Right? So I don't know if everybody's, anybody's looked in the A2L codes. That's the new codes for refrigerants. Right? Um, the way the codes, they're working on the codes, because it doesn't fit the National Building Code for Canada and the U.S., it, you basically got to have a sensor in there, like a, like a fuel sensor, that shuts down your furnace, but fires the motor on high speed to dissipate any, any refrigerant in the system, right? Because if that fires, you could set off and boil off that refrigerant or light it on fire, right? So we do not carry the D out. I do know other manufacturers do. I do know there's a way of doing it. But for us as a manufacturer, we it is not approved to be done that way. What you guys do in the field is what you guys do in the field. Okay? Um, so single stage, two stage. I don't know how to wire it up. Pretty straightforward. You're carrying all your wires out to the system. Based on your thermostat, you're going to decide whether your um, thermostat, you're switching in cooling mode, uh, default cooling, or default heating mode, right, for your heat pump. We did breakers already. Uh, installation of the breakers. So this is the top part of your air handler, right? So you have your power, your circuit breakers, and number two that are going to go in there, power cords. This air handler is designed for one power coming in. So if you design the power for electric backup, you bring it into the unit. You do not have to bring two services in the unit. You don't bring a service for the air handler, and you don't bring a service for the electric backup. It's one. And then there's a Molex connector that brings power from the breakers to feed power to the air handler, okay? So it's gonna cross feed across. So you're only bringing one service in. Um, there's other air handlers out there where you gotta bring power into the air handler. Backup, so you need two breakers, two power feeds. This is a single power feed, okay? To access this, you're gonna remove that uh, box in the breaker cover, and there's a panel right there at the back. You take that panel out, slide your electric back up in. Screw the two boxes back on. There's two screws for each one. Mount your breakers and you're done. So very easy to put the electric back up into the system. You don't have that, the part number for that single point entry No, I don't. Single point entry kit? Do you have a part number for it? No. No? Okay. No. We had Eric, so sorry. And I looked this way. <laughs> um, yeah, so that single point entry kit, it brings the power into there and then splits it to feed two breakers. That's what a single point entry kit is. So you can do it two ways. You can mount it on the back side, back in here, or they clip right on the side. Okay? They do come with a little cover on it that most people throw away. It's important to keep that cover and put it back on there once you wire it up. Because if not, the insulation could get pulled in there and you could start a fire inside the electrical cavity uh, of that box. Okay? Any electric backup? It's pretty straightforward. It's easy to install in the system. Uh, let's go for the outdoor units. Um, so on the outdoor units, we've put zip ties in there. You installed this unit, didn't you? Me? Yeah. 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 So we have zip ties on the outside um, for the two three ton inside. So you can strap your wires in. There is pre-done knockouts. So the two green ones are for your thermostat and your power. Uh, the other one is for your refrigeration lines. Now this knockout. Um, you have three entry points for everything. You have the front, you have the right side, or the back side to come in. These knockouts are very large. Um, you're going to want to seal them up. And what, what I did on my house was, I actually just took a hole saw and drilled two holes to fit my line set in there. 
so I didn't have to fill out a big knockout. So I took the size of my Armaflex, or Rubitex, whatever you want to call it, and cut a hole that size, a little bit bigger, slid it in, and just cocked them. So we want to keep rodents out and all that kind of stuff. That's all it's really for. But it is a, a large knockout for your refrigeration lines. Uh, and then if you do a 24, 36, everything's mounted a little higher. The other thing that, to note is, um, with the new refrigerants, it's going to change. The 4860, your king valves are on the side of the unit, on the outside. Okay? For this here, 2436, your king valves are inside the unit. Okay? So they will get moved out with the new refrigerant change because it's got to be redesigned to put them on the outside so they're all going to be on the outside. Okay? And this is where those flex connectors are going to come in handy. These here. It's going to bring you straight out here and stick it out so you can braze outside or out the side, but it is short to go out the back side. And like I said, I'm trying to extend those so you got more uh, line sticking out the side of the unit. So any questions so far? No? Clear as mud? Everything's good? All right. So we'll go through the function settings on the dip switches and stuff like that. Uh, once we're done these slides, we're going to go into the thermostat, talk about the thermostat and that, and then I got a video of the heat exchanger, and um, we can take the heat exchanger out of that other furnace there so you guys can see what it looks like and how it works and stuff like that. Pardon? So I got time last week, and they played the Eye of the Tiger in the background. <laughs> yeah, and they had it going. They gave me a two-minute penalty, so I was like four minutes and ten seconds because the guy gave me uh, a short bit. And you need a longer bit to get the one screw out, so I couldn't get it fully out. But I had the blower section and the heat exchanger basically out in two minutes. Um, but again, I said to them, there's no thermostat wire, there's no electrical, and there's no gas or venting hooked up to it. So 10 minutes to do all that kind of So he looks like a NASCAR picture guy. Pretty much. There was a guy sitting there, I'm like, here, hold these. Was he wearing a helmet? No. <laughs> I left my helmet at home. So we're going to watch this video. This is the video off the YouTube page on how to do the dip switches. Uh, when we first brought the manual out, um, you would have seen it. We're going to that unit. The dip switches are upside down. And in the manual, they were upside right. And everybody was confused which way was what. And the switches were black, but they're white on the board. So we actually put colored images in the manual now and did a video. Only qualified personnel should install Napoleon appliances and accessories. See product manual for details. This video will summarize key components of the Napoleon NS18 main control board, as well as settings and connections when installing a hybrid heating system. The little white spots are snow. Dip switch. From the factory, the two and three ton NS18 will ship with the dip switch set to a three ton cooling capacity. If the four and five ton unit is being installed, the dip switch will be factory set to a 5 ton capacity. <coughs> to configure the dip switch to a 2 ton or 4 ton setting, the switch in the number 1 position will need to be moved up, as shown here. To configure the dip switch to a 3 or 5 ton capacity with extended defrost, the switch in the number 1 position will need to be down, and the switch in the number 2 position will need to be up, as shown here. The next area we will focus on is an LED display. The memory chip contains all of the operation information which manages the <coughs> If replacing the control board, a memory chip is not provided, so it must be removed and transferred to the new board. <coughs> Two and three ton memory chips are not compatible on four and five ton boards, and vice versa. When troubleshooting, the LED display will present fault codes to identify operation errors within the system. Use the codes displayed in conjunction with the product manual to identify and solve system errors. To engage a force defrost function for troubleshooting purposes, bring your attention to the SW buttons on the right control board. Press SW1 and hold it for 5 seconds until the LED display starts flashing. Next, press SW1 until the LED display shows 06 and press SW2 or SW3 to confirm the setting. Once done, the display will show on. Once you see on, press SW1 to save the setting. Lastly, we will take a look at the system wiring. The L1, L2, and ground are located on the left-hand side below the control board. All electrical connections must be made in accordance with the installation manual and all local codes. Thermostat connections must be made to the board on the right-hand side. Ensure the correct 
wires are connected to the outdoor unit, matching the labels to those connected to the thermostat. For more information, refer to the service manual found on the Napoleon.com product page under Support Documents for <coughs> Professionals. Click here to view the Wolf Steel Technical YouTube page. So pretty easy to follow, and that's what you're going to get off our YouTube page. Nice videos, clear to the point, and not all the uh, sales stuff to go with and stuff like that. <coughs> so, um, we'll kind of go through, review that video. So that's your display right on the uh, unit outdoors for all your, your codes that you're going to receive for any fall codes or your selection options on there. Dip switches are up on the top right hand corner. Like I said, that board is inverted. So when you look at it, it's actually upside down. Um, when you phys we'll look at that one there so you can actually see it. The easy way to understand the dip switches, the first one is your tonnage, defrost mode, and then your options. In your climate, I would assume you're only dealing with number one and number two. That's it. So number one is your tonnage, three, three ton, or two ton, comes as three, comes as five. The next one, strong defrost or not, and the last ones, you really, I don't believe you're going to use them, but you'll find out when you get in there. And we'll talk about those other switches. So there's three ton, five ton out of the box. And that's what it's going to look like for two ton or four ton in standard defrost mode. <coughs> and that's just images of those. When we go to strong defrost, um, you're just changing dip switch number two. Uh, most like I don't think you guys would need strong defrost here. Um, we're, our recommendation is um, like Western US, so Montana's and that, they're going to use it there, and we use it in Western Canada and Northern Ontario. In my area, I don't even use strong defrost, right? So I leave a standard defrost mode. It just extend. Extends the defrost time, yep. And the last one is operation modes. And you, the, you may use uh, strong mode or standard mode, and that's going to extend your, with your compressor ratio. Um, energy savings mode. Um, I don't think you'd ever use it unless you're in that spot where you're a three ton and you need to save a bit of energy and try to drop it down a bit. It's going to change that for you. Um, the l last one here, my big thing is if the homeowner reads the manual and actually understands they can have an energy mode and lower their carbon footprint type stuff, they're, they're going to ask for that. But um, I don't know anybody's used this and we've used this in Western Canada for, for the strong mode. So two, two was your no, one is your tonnage, oh, 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 okay. two is your defrost, and three and four is your operation mode. And that's all the dip switches you need to change. So ultimately, in my opinion, and for your, your guys' area, you're probably just going to use dip switch number one. And you're going to slap between two and three, or four and five ton, and that's it. So, but strong mode is your, your compression. For your compressor, it's going to change your compression ratios, okay. right? So gonna gonna it's going to rip harder, faster, or? harder and faster. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So fan speeds. Uh, this is on the air handler on the inside. Your furnace is going to be different based on what you're going to run your furnace with. Okay. So on the air handler inside, these are your fan speeds. Fan speeds are all based off your heating cycle, not your cooling cycle. Okay. So when you look at the charts, they're all going to say zeros for cooling, and then you're going to select based on your application for heating mode. Okay? Uh, as the charts say here, uh, your two ton, your, two, your sorry, your 2436 is default for number four, and 4860 is default for number six for your application. That's where they're already set on the charts. All right? And then based off your static pressure, this is what the charts look like. And this is what the gentleman was talking about with all the dashes. Wherever the dashes are, we don't want to be in that area. Okay? That takes us out of our design system. Okay? So based on your static pressures, top line is your static pressure. What do you guys know where you run static pressures at? 0.4, 0 0.5? Yeah. Okay. I've <laughs> I had people tell me they run it at 0.2. And that's, uh, in my opinion, a bad static pressure to run a system on. So this is where you're looking at, right? So right now, 0.4 on uh, 24, you're at 960 CFM, right? So then you're just going to change that based on your stack design. So there's times that your size and your, your CFM is at 350 per ton. Okay. If you're at five inches of water column, or five inches of static pressure, 0.5, sorry. Yeah. 
um, you're not getting anywhere near 800 CFM. So if you have a humidity issue within the home, like I'm just saying, if you were to go to speed, if you're 0.5, yeah. You need less than 1090. If you're in the dash, what's going to happen? Is that going to run? You, you may have issues with your you motor. Can't, are you saying you got the pull-in can't guarantee? That's right. Operation. Yep. That's the range we want you to be. So you said uh, 350 CFM per ton? That's, that's like Florida, like humid climate. But if you have a little bit steel with humidity, humidity issues. issues. Okay. So if I have a humidification issues, I'm going to undersize my tonnage. Because I want to dehumidify first, right? And that's what we were talking about earlier. If it's three and a half tons, where would I go? I go three. I wouldn't put a four ton unit in, right? Because cooling is designed to dehumidify first and then cool second, <coughs> right? Yeah, when you have applications that we, your main HVAC unit can't ring it out itself, then it's education time, you know, Santa Fe or something like that to build into the, the house to help, you know, with. Uh, Right? So, yeah. Um, my, my area is 450 CFM per ton. Yeah. That's what we, we run by. Right? So if you're doing, I've never done in Florida, so if they're doing 350 per ton, I, I have no idea, but you're still going to want to fit in that range of where it's going to be, right? Why does the air handler need to know the OB call, the O call? So my question is, what controls the fan speed is it the G call because there's no Y terminal right so if there's if you, you have to energize the heat so if there's a call for heat you're getting the air handler needs to know oh why does it need to know oh when that call so the air handler will fire right in defrost mode okay. the furnace will not okay. the air handler does not have uh, a fossil fuel application in it right so it's electric backup. So it can fire, and that electric backup is always above, usually above your coil. So it's not going to. So when you have an air handler system set up, your your air handler will turn and get airflow. Okay. So that's going to carry that. On the air handlers is controlled through G, like. Yeah. A lot of your old, old, older systems, G call is low speed fan, and then you have your Y for cooling or whatnot, but yep. yours is controlled through the G. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So th this here, you're, for me, the application would be I'd need to re look at redesigning the ductwork to make it work so I get in that range, right? Yeah. Or I'm, I'm changing my dip switch to go to um, a more CFM. So it's a really application based on what your duct design is in the house and how much air you're ca carrying through there, right, and what it's going to sound like. It may mean you got to redo eight or ten feet of ductwork, right, on your main trunk to satisfy the airflows that you're you're looking at, or is the homeowner fine with a bit of noise, right? But as as all you can do is stay out of these dashes because you're you're leading towards a failure in your motor. Does that answer your question? Okay. So. When you do, you guys measure, or you just kind of look at it as a rule of thumb and say where it's at. We generally measure. So you're putting a pitot tube in the supply and the return, finding finding your differences for your stack pressures. Yeah. Okay. Because that's truly the only way you can find your static pressures, right? Is by measuring it. Sorry, this is a TDSP, right? Like you're taking return. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Taking away standard the negative and it's just standard static good. pressures. Yep. Okay. Yep. So one of our videos we're actually doing on the YouTube page is actually how to measure static pressures too, right? So we're doing videos for those as well. And even to the point that if you have uh, an A coil in there, not a case coil, what's your static pressure above and below your coil, right? So you can actually figure out if your coil is plugged. Right, how much st static drop you got across that coil too, right? So that will help you to understand that too. Okay, but traditionally this is going to be above your coil and your return, right? So for me, when I measure statics, I measure within the first two feet of my main takeoff. I don't measure my plenum, and I measure six feet. No, 
and I don't measure, I measure six feet up on my return. And the reason why I don't measure my plenum is there's too much turbulent air in the plenum sometimes. I want to get out of that once it's off the first main takeoff. If I have like an octopus style where it's everywhere, I'll measure my plenum. But if I can, I get away from my plenum and measure out. Unless I'm measuring across my coil to find my static pressure. But that's just me, how I do it. Okay? Uh, function settings. I think this is one of the best features that we have on this unit, aside from dip switches and everything else. And the reason being is I have the ability to do uh, defrost mode outside. So as the service technician, I can put the unit in a, in a defrost mode right away at the outdoor unit. I don't have to go in the house and see if it's what's going on though. So I can just put it in defrost application, right? So you'll see in the manual, it always says debugging. The debugging is the, all the boards communicate in these units. Uh, lots of electronics, so that's them communicating back and forth before it goes through the debug situation. So I can do a defrost mode. Um, the other one is refrigerant recovery, right? So other terminology is pump down, right? So no different than when you guys remove an air conditioner, do you guys actually reclaim with a reclaim tank or do you just suck the refrigerant back in the unit, right? Oh, there you go. So sometimes you, you do a pump down, right? Close one king valve, close the contactor. I can do that on the unit now, outside. So I don't need a reclaim tool or a pump or nothing. I can just do a straight pump down on the unit, right? So if I got a plug filter dryer, something like that, I can do a pump or I got to cut a TXV valve in or whatever, change it out, I can do a pump down. The other option is forced operation mode. And for me, this, in my opinion, is the best mode out there. I can run it in heating mode or cooling mode from the outdoor unit. Why would that be a great feature for us as a technician? Time saver. Time saver? See if you got a restriction. You don't have to go inside. What else? There's one big feature that saves that I, I really like about this. So let me ask you this way. When you go to a no heat call on a furnace, what do you guys do? Okay. So as I go to the furnace, I take all the wires off the th furnace and jump our R&W. And why would I want to jump our R&W and take all the wires off? Isolate. Isolate. What can I do here? I don't have to worry about the thermostat wired up right. I don't worry about the furnace wired up right. I can prove that heat pump outside is working the way it's designed because I'm doing force mode out of the board. Jumping R&W is the same way. Furnace manufacturers don't provide you with a thermostat, right? It's an add-on. Humidifier is an add-on. Electric air cleaner is an add-on. AC, heat pump, all those things are add-ons. Do they all cause problems to our boards? Absolutely. So we isolated it, jump our R&W, the furnace is working the way it was designed. And in my mind, if it was designed with a thermostat, the thing would be welded on there, soldered on there, and part of the unit, right? It's not. We build furnaces at the factory, we jump our R&W, we fire every single furnace before it leaves the factory. We don't put a thermostat on it. We run it through a heating cycle. This is the same application. I can fire that unit up outside without going in the house, Right? Without worrying about the furnace not done right, without worrying that they use telephone wire or speaker wire for the thermostat wire and one of the leads are broke, right? Or they put a nail through the wall, all those things. I can prove that heat pump is working by itself. That's all I care about right now. Then I can look at all the other applications of what's causing a problem. I've been to furnaces where they don't work and then I start adding things onto it. I used to carry a Honeywell touchscreen thermostat with a six foot piece of wire with a magnet on the back in my service bag. I'd stick it to the side of the furnace, wire it up myself, make sure it worked. And as soon as I wired their thermostat up, it didn't work. I know it's their wire or their thermostat. But I've isolated it. I've saved myself a bunch of time running up and down the stairs or yelling at my apprentice or the homeowner, hey, can you turn that up a bit more? I need to fire some more. I can do it all right in front of me, right? So this, in my opinion, is a great time saver for us. So to go through there, SW1, we go to look for SW9 using uh, switch two or three, and then we can select that module, uh, control, and then do forced cooling mode or forced heating mode. <coughs> and once I have that, I just select, select it and say on, right? 
and then I can actually run in that full cycle of the heating mode and make sure what's going on. So with the, if it's a heat pump outside of your condenser, you're doing this from the condenser? Yep. This is on the board outside of the unit. Is, is that going to, how would that bring on the fan? I don't care about the fan coming on. I want to make sure you just want to that, 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 that unit's working. Heat pump turns on. Yep. So could it, I mean, could it lock out if the indoor fan's not running? It's not going to. It's not going to run long enough. I just want to prove the cycle is running. The compressor's firing up. The outdoor fan's turning on, right? You can actually sit there. So that unit fired up uh, this morning, or was it yesterday? Yesterday when we were here, and you can actually hear the reverse valve click, right? So I heard it click and turn on. Okay, I know it's in cycle. I looked over at the thermostat. Yeah, it was going. Sure, the furnace was going, but I could hear it. How long does it run in that cycle? You you can go and you got to turn it off. Right, so you're sitting there on the board and you're just going to turn it off, right? So if your fan's not running... You get a choice, you get a choice of heat or cool, right? Yeah, you get a choice of heat or cool. So you can run in both cycles. So a brand new install, for me, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to test it, I'm going to run heat mode, cooling mode, make sure everything is working right. So let it run for five minutes, what's going to happen? You're going to get residual heat or cool blow through the house. Sure, maybe your fan's not going to come on, no big deal. It's not going to run for, there's no airflow. I just want to prove the cycle's going and everything's operating in the system, right? So if I go to a call, a service call, I'm going to walk out of that unit. Same as when I did propane. What's the first thing propane guys do when they go to the house when there's no heat? You go and see if the tank's got propane in it, right? Same thing. I can go and look at this before I go to the house or natural gas, my area. Um, if you don't pay your gas bill, and it's come pin your meter out. So now you have no gas. So if I get a service call for no heat in the fall, I walk by the house, I look where the gas meter is, see if there's a little pin in there. Nope, okay, so clearly there's something wrong with the furnace. And the next thing I do is look for is the wall switch, because someone put a, in my area, you got the wall switch on the ceiling, or six feet up, and everybody always puts a shelf there and puts a basket in front of it, and hits the wall switch off and shuts the furnace off. Yeah. 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 Like Thought it was the light. Yep. You just turn the switch, fires back up. So this helps me do the same thing. Look for those easy things right away to figure out what's going on with the system. Okay. Uh, maintenance and commissioning. We talked about this already about registering everything. Um, do you guys do startup sheets and stuff like that on your equipment so you know what's going on? Yeah. It, it's for me it's one of the biggest things is startup sheets especially on the furnace side if you don't do a startup sheet right how do you know what the issue is when you get there you have no idea you have no base point right so gas pressures your voltages all that kind of stuff right I feel as manufacturers and we're the same we make it idiot proof because if you have a reverse polarity in a furnace what's it do flashes at you Gives you a code, right? So you know you gotta switch the wire, stuff like that. If you call in the customer solutions and you have a problem, if you don't have the base information, you're wasting our time and your time because we gotta spend an hour trying to get that base information, then decipher whether we're in a good spot or not, right? If you already have a base point where it was when you started up, you can figure out what's going on easier with a startup sheet, okay? So whether you guys have your own startup sheets or there's ones in the manuals, have those and, and utilize them. Any questions about any of that? No? None? Perfect. Okay. So that's the heat pumps. Okay. Any questions about the heat pumps? None? Okay. Thermostats? So we'll go through the thermostat. Uh, once we're done these slides, uh, we'll go over and look at the equipment over there and kind of go through the setup that they have here so you guys can see an operation on the thermostat and stuff like that. And then um, we'll do the video for the furnace as well and then we'll go and look at the furnace and see how the heat exchanger comes out in that. And that will take us to like 11.30, quarter to 12. And we'll have lunch here too. So, there we go.
if anybody wants to stay and ask questions after the class, and just one-on-one. -on -one. If you guys would like to get on to the Napoleon site, also, if you guys can give me your emails, I can get you signed up on that. So you have access to it. So here's, here's what you get in a thermostat. Um, so you're going to get the base thermostat in the box. Uh, you're going to get stick. Oh, I wouldn't use those. And then inside the unit, you get, um, you get the, the mounting plates with a, a level that, in my opinion, works sometimes and probably doesn't work in the other times. You guys are familiar with those. Um, we give you a, a base plate, so you can mount a base plate on there. You get your outdoor sensor with a, a wire. So this is a wireless sensor. This here is your probe to go outside to get your outdoor temperatures. So this gets mounted in the house. Normally what I do is I drill out the kick plate, the sill plate, stick that outside with a 3 8 pilot bit. Stick it in. When you put this outside, you want somewhere that it's not going to be affected by heat. Right? So not in direct sunlight. Tuck it under a siding lip or something like that, or brick ledge. Do not put it in your armor flex beside your refrigeration lines. Okay? Um, then you get plugs, and then you get uh, not a broken uh, indoor sensor. That was out of my garage. Uh, but you get the indoor sensor that comes with it. And that's everything that comes in the box. Okay, so someone asked earlier over there, do you get all that stuff with it? Yes, that all comes as one kit. Okay. <laughs> so we have the digital resources for you to go to, again, on our website, so you can get any information you want on there. There is kind of basic troubleshooting for the homeowner on the website too so they can do Wi-Fi we have an app they can download they can control it by an app all the functions you would expect from a, uh, a Wi-Fi thermostat okay so why why this was created so for us in Ontario we were given a grant from the government the, the provincial government and then from the fuel supplier so a company called Enbridge that supplies natural gas for most of Midwest Canada and all of Ontario. So they bought the other fuel company out. So the fuel supplier, actually, the supplies of natural gas, gave us money to build a, a thermostat that fires on a heat pump. So, um, so the biggest thing was to create, uh, to get for their greener home grant for the province, and then flexible options uh, due to fluctuating rates and charges. Um, and what that is, is the way the thermostat is designed, we have a function called switching tables. It's called hybrid mode. And what happens is, in Ontario only right now, the fuel supplier gave us what every homeowner pays as a rate. And then the hydro company gave us whatever hydro rate they paid. And in hybrid mode, it switches between heat pump or furnace, gas furnace, at a rate payment. So if the hydro is cheaper, it'll fire up the heat pump. If natural gas is cheaper throughout the day, it'll switch over and turn on the furnace. It chooses what it wants and switches by itself. So it's very intuitive that way that it controls it by itself. Um, to make that application work, we need to know what the rates are the homeowner pays. So there's a couple ways we can do it for your area, because right now your, uh, your companies do not provide the rates. And we're working on an application where the homeowner can type in their own rates on the app, and then it'll build switching tables for them. So if the rate changes, they're able to do that. Uh, so in the thermostat, you have a startup uh, smart wizard setup mode, brand selection, and then our app. Um, because we sell those two brands, you know, uh, it's built in there. You just select which option you want on that thermostat. Um, so in Ontario, uh, right now, because that's the only way that program works automatically, they do the registration. Um, and once the registration is done, they put in their information. Uh, it's based on, um, we use postal codes instead of zip codes, but the zip code tells you what the rate is for that area and which company we need to pull the data from. Because we have like city hydro, we have province hydro and stuff like that. So depending on where you are, it pulls certain rates. And then they, they can see it on their application on their app. The good part is if they're in these switching tables, the, for my house, I can actually see how much money I'm saving. So it actually gives you a bar graph and shows you 
the amount you're saving and what mode's running more. Cooling, uh, your heat pump mode or, or your, your uh, fossil fuel mode. So it switches back and forth. Uh, so in Ontario, uh, we have comfort mode, low cost, green, and then night mode. So comfort mode is whatever one's going to get us to the temperature as desired. Low cost is whatever's more efficient and dollar value wise. Uh, green mode is basically your heat pump's going to run all the time unless it can't satisfy, then it kicks over because it has a lower carbon footprint, supposedly, than <laughs> fuels. And then night mode is just to maximize your air, low airflow and keep it comfortable in the house. Uh, outside of Ontario, so if you did not put switching tables in there, this is what your application would be. Um, you got hybrid mode or dual fuel. So hybrid mode, um, you would have to build switching tables for that. Um, there's an application, a way of doing that. Or when they register it, they can put in their current rate they pay and we'll build the switching table for them. But if their rates change, they would have to submit the registration again for us to do it again, because it's not automatic. Right? Dual, dual fuel heating mode, very similar to any other thermostat. It's going to choose which one it's going to go for, right? As an application and basic product registration. So we kind of went through this already, what you're going to get in that box, right? Um, this is designed that you can put on there, okay? Outdoor sensor counts as one. Um, you do have the application of doing geolocation. So geolocation is based on whatever the prominent airport or whatever program it runs for here. I don't know if it's the post office or municipal building, whatever that geolocation is for this area, that's what it would pick up. Or you can do an outdoor sensor. My application, I use the outdoor sensor. I'm 45 minutes from the airport from the city and I live in two and a half acres in a bush. Right? Geolocation does not help me at all. Right, because the wind changes, everything changes because I'm surrounded by trees. So I use an outdoor sensor. What's the rule of thumb on distance for that outdoor sensor? Rule of thumb? Or just, yeah, I mean, like, what's the range on that? Um, there's nowhere really we state because it runs through Wi Fi, right? Oh, that's not directly <coughs> connected to the. No, it's not. It's not yeah this is this is wireless <coughs> this is just your probe to go outside right i know i just didn't know if it had, if it had to be a certain distance from the thermostat. yeah i got asked that last week and our innovation team hasn't got back to me right because uh, you know my house i'm built into a hill so i got freaking <coughs> concrete pillars like this in my walls to hold up a retaining wall right yeah. so mine are all very close but i i've asked them to give me what the maximum distance is right like we use bluetooth on our fireplaces I know it's 70 feet clear line of sight. Once you start putting things in, that reduces, right? Uh, they haven't given me the information on this yet to figure out, do you gotta be within 20 feet, 10 feet, what the application is. So I had that question into them right now because I got asked that last week. And, and I also got asked, can we make, do we have the ability to tie in a wired outdoor sensor? Because uh, in British Columbia, they get a grant if it's a wired outdoor sensor, not a wireless outdoor sensor, which is weird. Yeah. Right, so they've asked how we can tie that in, so I'm waiting for those answers um, back from them. But um, like I know we, we got in some houses that are 24 inch square feet and it's working fine and, and bigger. And we have it through our factory as well and it's working. Um, so yeah, you can add 10 sensors. The outdoor sensor counts as one. You do have the ability to disengage the sensor on the thermostat, okay? So it's got a thermistor in the back side, right? It's going to read the temperatures. You can disengage this. Um, so my house is disengaged. My thermostat's in a closet, all right? Because my, my walls are nice and clean. And that way my fiance cannot turn up the heat when she feels cold. And she can just grab a blanket because uh, she doesn't even have the app on her phone, right? So good application. Um, the best application for that is, is if you're in a house and you cannot get thermostat wires up there, enough wires, you can put that right beside the, the furnace, down in the furnace room now, and just put sensors in the house, right? So depending on your application, you need six wires for that, right? If you can't get a six wire up there, um, you're, you're wondering what you're gonna do, right? Mount it down by the, by the furnace, right? And then use the sensors to control everything else. Shut the thermistor off on that, and okay? Really messing with the spouses at that point. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, we do have an option to buy, uh, add a wire, um, where you can gain an extra wire. 
Um, there's other ones on the market too. Um, this will help you if you have five wires and you need that sixth wire, right? So you could gain a wire by using this. Okay, so imagine your thermostat wires now only have four and you're trying to get that fifth one. So you gain that extra wire for your fifth wire that you already had there to create your sixth wire. So if you needed six wires, you could use this to as that application. Does that make sense? Yeah? Uh, it comes with a checklist on how to set everything up um, for the install. So pairing sensors, these are designed that um, um, once you go to pair them, there'll be another slide on it, um, but these covers pop off the back, there's a little button in the back. We're gonna press that button and that's gonna help us pair the sensors up um, to the thermostat. They are all uh, AAA batteries, so you don't have to worry about those little round um, energizer disc batteries or anything like that. You're using standard AAA batteries for this. Two batteries for each one. So wiring, uh, that's the add a wire, which is pretty straightforward. The module tells you what you have there and how many you're bringing down, right? So here we have uh, RC, which is our Y or G or W, and then we tie up backside, we pick up the extra wire for our G. If you had that five wire coming down, that fifth wire would be actually carrying down for your OB, right? So you could use that for your OB and pick up G through the add a wire kit. Okay. So on the back of our thermostats, a couple of different things that are kind of a good feature. If you want to work on this at the shop and start doing some of the programming, you can actually actually use that um, USB, whatever the Nokia phones used to be, the little flip phones, that funny, uh, micro USB. is it micro USB? You can plug this right in off a computer and energize the thermostat with that cable. So we have that option. Um, right there to power it and then we have a dip switch in the back right so if you're doing RCRH um, based on your connections you're going to select it to be on or off right so on here uh, RCRH if RC and RH is connected you hit it up to connect if it's not you go down to disconnect right so you have to do that selection on the back of the thermostat and from there uh, basic wiring setups on how you're going to wire the system in um, and these are all in the manual as well so on the far side, conventional heat and cooling, heat pump air handler, or heat pump and furnace, okay, for the wiring setups for them. Pretty straightforward on those. Um, if you tie it into our furnace, it's where it gets a little different. Um, we have a jumper wire here at O. You actually have to cut that wire, okay? If not, it holds the signal. So you gotta cut it so the signal passes through. Uh, other manufacturers do things like that for different boards as well. So you're going to do that and carry that through through your B, down to your O, to your B, okay, uh, and carry that signal through there. And other than that, it's pretty straightforward for the wiring setup, and like I said, we don't do the D for defrost mode, right, so that's not carried into the furnace. And this is what you're looking for, wire setups of what you need for wires based on what system you have tied in there, okay. This thermostat does work on any other furnace out there. Um, so based on your application, how many heat cools, your stages, these are how many wires you're going to need. Doing our system with two stage heat, you're going to need um, six wires. Now being that, that being said, on our furnace, doing single stage heat with a single stage thermostat, so you could get away with five wires, and we have uh, dip pins that you move which will go for a five minute delay or a 10 minute delay on your heating cycle for second stage. And what that is, is if your thermostat is not satisfied within five minutes, it kicks in the second stage. If it's not satisfied within 10 minutes, it kicks in second stage, okay? I traditionally set that for 10 minutes because I don't want to short cycle from one stage to two. I want to see if it's going to make it there. So it's a matter of moving a pin, but it comes out of the box that is none. And that's where you need the two heat and one cool. So your six wire application. Any questions about that? No? So on the setup mode, once you power the thermostat and get it on the wall, you go through and do your selection of your wires. Um, of which ones you have hooked up. If you select a terminal and you don't have a wire hooked to it, it will actually disengage it. So you can hit the button. Uh, the spot on the screen and then it'll disappear on you because that wire is not connected. So it senses that as well. But you have to go through and do your selections. Uh, heat pump, air to air, 
is what you select on there. Uh, OB setting. So your OB setting is uh, fail in heating mode, not cooling mode. So depending on where you've been in the industry, most of them fail in cooling mode. This one's opposite. It's fail in heat. So make sure you select that. Okay, so it's got to be in heating mode. Uh, heating type, uh, furnace or boiler, uh, depending on your application. Um, for us as a manufacturer, we're coming up with a, a hydronic air handler, so we have that built into our thermostat already. And then from here, you select your heating source, and then heat fan control by thermostat or by furnace. Okay, uh, you're going to select it by, by thermostat, so you have the options to control it on your thermostat. Any questions about that? Pretty straightforward. And then through here, you can do your accessories. Humidifier, dehumidifier, evaporator, or steam, if you're putting that in the system. Now on the bottom here, it says calibrating room temp and humidity. Uh, it'll do that, and it says one hour calibration. So that comes up every time you shut the power off. When it comes up on the screen, the thermostat is still operational, okay? What it means is between your room sensors and the thermostat, all the thermistors take an hour to fully calibrate to make sure it's reading everything properly, okay? So when it's doing the calibration, tell the homeowner it's not a big issue. If they lose power, it'll come back up and it'll have to recalibrate again, okay? It's still fully operational. It's trying to get the best average within 60 minutes for the entire dwelling. One thing to note is when you install this thermostat, and you run your thermostat wires in the back, make sure you seal up that hole in the back side of that thermostat, best as you can. Because the thermistor is on the back side of this here, and it will pick up the wall cavity temperature. So if you're in a house, and you find that after 20 minutes your thermostat's dropping in temperature, that means it's gaining air temperature sense from the back side of this thermostat. So easy way to, to figure that out is disengage this and run off a room sensor, and guarantee it's going to drop, jump back up from like 66 to 72, if that's what the room is, okay? What it is is um, we had a thermostat in the house, and they ran the thermostat wires up the return air cavity from the second floor, and it's picking up the cold air being drawn back from the room, and it's affecting the backside of the thermostat, okay? So once we disengaged that, the room sensor, they had the old thermostat there, and the the screen displayed the exact same temperature as the old sensor because the room sensor was sitting beside it and it was just picking up back the airflow on the back side so make sure it's not a great big half inch hole for a five wire or six wire running up there okay make sure it's kind of sealed up a bit all right so for programming on the thermostat and we show you over there it'll come up uh, to add a sensor you're going to push that button on the back side um, for three to five seconds and then it'll pop up on the screen once it pairs, and then you'll be able to see it on the screen and add that sensor in there, okay? Um, so that's the basic installation of the thermostat. Pretty straightforward, any questions? No? So through the registration, they can register on the stat. This is what kind of what the screen's gonna look like. Picking up all the uh, basic screen displays that you normally see everywhere else. It does come in Celsius or Fahrenheit. You can switch it back and forth. Um, on the app, this is all the registration. Uh, on the app, this is what the homeowner's experience is going to see. Okay, So on here, they have the ability to see anything that you'd normally see on the thermostat. Your schedule, energy use is what they'll get uh, during that cycle mode and be able to go through and see what's going on with the uh, hybrid mode. But all your set points, humidity, what stage it's in, heating mode, anything that you'd expect on your app to see and control the thermostat, you'll be able to do that, okay? So the homeowner experience, um, based on the application of the thermostat, that's the main screen they're gonna see. Uh, this is their menu option button on here. So they can select that and it brings up all their controls on the thermostat. So system, hybrid heating is that switching table option where it switches by itself, okay? But you have your vacation mode, weather sensors, schedule, all the basic stuff on there for them. And then like I said, on our website we have the ability to do the uh, questions and answers. And this is updated all the time. More questions we get on our consumer side, 
we start populating more answers on there of what we're getting questioned from homeowners. Okay? Any questions about the thermostat? No, with Green, with their inverter system, if you don't use their smart thermostat, it runs just as a two stage compressor. Does Napoleon have anything similar if you're not using their thermostat? Okay. Operation changes or so Ream use a communicating stat, yeah. right? This is just yeah. because it's not communicating, you can use any That's stat. right. right, yeah. So for our wiring, you don't have to run shielded wire. Yeah. You can run a regular thermostat wire. None of it's communicating like Ream is. Yeah. So, yeah, so you don't have to worry about that, having special wire and all that kind of stuff. You're running standard wire for it, right? And that's why our thermostat can work on any system out there. Right, so if you have an existing furnace and the homeowner doesn't want to replace the furnace, but they want that heat pump, you can do a case coil, the heat pump, and our thermostat to run the system. Okay? Uh, on the thermostat, we are working with, we have our own innovation team that designed the controls and everything on the thermostat. They are designing the application where it will send you an error code as well. Okay? Um, we're not there at that point yet, but they're working on designing that. The other thing you can do is, does anybody, uh, companies manage properties and stuff like that? Like rental units or cottages and stuff? No? Um, if you do, on your app on your phone or on a tablet, you can, you can have 100 thermostats on there. So you can manage a property if you, your, your business does that and see everybody's thermostats. So one of, when I was in sales, one of my contractors manages 36 cottages on a lake for this cottage group, he can see every single thermostat and how they're operating in that house. So part of his contract is to manage, make sure nothing freezes in those houses, right? So every, throughout the day, they check them to make sure everything's fine. So you have the ability to add multiple thermostats on there to, to watch it on your app as well. Uh, we are gonna get to the point that it'll send you a notification too if there's an error, right? So if there's a fault code or it's dropping in temperature, right? If it hasn't made temperature for three hours, you'll get a code so you can go there and figure out what's going on, okay? Any questions about that? No? So on that learning portal as well, um, that we were just talking about, there is a full course in there on hybrid heating and on the thermostat there, you can take the whole course and follow through and see how it's done as well. Probably in more detail than what I did because I probably missed something that the course didn't. Okay. This is our 9600 furnace that we have here. Uh, they, they brought in and put in here. Uh, in, in my opinion, and Eric's probably going to say the same thing, and I, pretty much anybody in our company, and probably most people in the industry, this is kind of the bread and butter. Um, because it's two stage, right? So for a furnace you guys put in, if you guys do other manufacturers, your bread and butter is probably going to be that two stage, and probably, uh, depends on your market, probably around that 70,000 mark, right? It's probably your bread and butter type furnace, right? Two stage. Uh, well, you guys still do mids too, right? So that's hard. Uh, we got rid of mids in Canada in 2004. So we don't even, us as a manufacturer, we don't even build, build a mid furnace. You get a single stage and that's it. Wow. Right? Yeah, so still paying for a wall. So because we build fireplaces, that's where our company started at. Um, this is the same glass we use in fireplaces. Right, so we're the only manufacturer in the industry that you can actually you can see the full burn without looking through a little hole, right? Um, so you can fully see it. Uh, this was great for me when I was a service guy because for me to go to a house, it was two hundred seventy-five dollars for me to ring your doorbell. And that was just get me there, ring your doorbell. Yeah. You got to give it sixty-five dollars. No, that that was me to the homeowner because I did pig barns, chicken barns, cattle barns. I did industrial stuff. So my rate was the same across the board. It didn't matter if it was residential or not. So I'd say, can you see fire in there? And they'd be like, yeah, okay. I said, okay, well your furnace is working, your blower's done. That was the easiest way to say to them, right? You're, you're not blowing air through there. Um, but it gave me an idea as a service call too, what to bring for parts. Um, you guys start stock the parts bags? Yeah, so we we provide parts bags. They come in a, like a little bag, and instead of floating around in boxes, um, you get every single part that's in here, except for a blower motor and a venter motor in a parts bag from, from Napoleon, right? So you should be able to fix any service call you go there. Uh, do you guys carry rescue motors on your truck? Yeah, some of you? That, that's for you. Um, our furnace, uh, it's designed you can throw a rescue motor on here and fire it up, right? So we can pull the ECM out of here, 
an easy way to diagnose if the ECM is working or not. Um, you have a 16 pin communication wire, you unplug that out of the board, the motor fire, the fan fires up, your brain's gone. If it doesn't, the whole motor's gone. Or you pull the five amp fuse off of there, all right? And that will fire it up right away. Uh, and if it fires, like I said, the brain's gone, tear it out, throw a PS, uh, rescue motor in here, standard PSE motor, go to your EC terminals for your EAC, what's the air cleaner, and it automatically provides 120 volts in the heating or cooling mode, all right? So this is designed for electric uh, air cleaners. So you can actually have a blower going uh, as a rescue motor uh, right out of the box and then bring in a new motor once you get a new one in there, right? And you know, up and running on a weekend without a problem. So I used to carry a rescue motor and cycled it through as I went on service calls. So I used the same one as a rescue, said, here's your motor for the weekend. Don't worry about it, we'll get you the new motor back. And once I took it back into the furnace, I went back in my truck as a, as a service part instead of putting electric uh, heaters in the house during the winter and that, right? So lots of good functions that way. Uh, on our furnace, um, we have a clear collector box. So you can actually see the secondary drain. It's fully clear, right? So I can truly see what's going on in that furnace. Um, if you do our 9700, which is a little up from this one, it comes with three doors. So there's a big stainless steel door on here. This is the one you can put in your kitchen. Um, it's quiet, fully inside the cabinet, all four sides. The only one in the industry. Um, so it gets these two doors and the big stainless steel one on there. You take the doors off, it's got a three-way door switch and the lower cabinet, upper cabinet uh, illuminates with LED lights. So you don't hold the flashlight in your mouth anymore, right? Or headlamp, it totally lights this cabinet and that cabinet. And then it comes with a UV light built into the furnace. So that uh, UV light is actually down on the side of the furnace. So if we look at this furnace, it doesn't get it. Um, the UV light would shine right up inside the heat exchanger. Okay. The 96, you can add it in there. So once you take this panel off down here, there's one quarter inch screw. Take it out, slide the UV light in there, transform on the board, plug it in. Now you got the UV light inside the unit. Roughly two year time for that UV light. So we have a basic one and then we have a medical version of it as well. So average, we say two years for the light expectancy for it, right? You guys put UV lights in now? Where are you putting them? Up here? Or in the return? Where, yeah, where's all the junk built up? Bottom of your coil, right? So uh, Eric does a good thing about this. He goes, show the, the lady in the house what the coil would look like with all the, you know, festations and everything on it. That UV light's killing it, right? So it's gonna shine right where we want it the bottom of that coil, not up here. I know we put it up here, we put it here, because that's the only option we got. Okay. But if we can actually get it in that, we set a heat exchanger, it's awesome, in my opinion. Um, drain, basic drain box, you can put it inside of the unit, outside of the unit. If you put it inside the unit, there's, this is insulated, cut the insulation away the side of your size of your drain, and then screw it right to the side of the box. Just cut it out with you until you know, it's nice and easy. This here, you can see you used half inch on here, right? Uh, the trick is you can use three quarter, like use this on here. This hose, this big hose, it comes longer. So we give you the same hose kit for all four positions. So you don't have to buy a separate kit for a downflow application or flow. That hose is long, you can actually cut it off. It fits right over the stubble on this and fits right inside of the three quarter T. So now you got a bushing, you don't have to glue it or silicone or nothing like that, it'll seal trap right up. So you don't have to switch from CBVs, CPVC to PVC, stuff like that, right? Just one set. What's that? Yeah, no bad. But you don't have to change sizes in your pipe, right? So I always just use this and I use that hose and that right down there and I don't have to worry about getting the other material in my truck. Okay. Right? So little tricks like that. Conversion kits on our furnace, uh, we carry one conversion kit and one conversion kit only, based on the, on the units. Um, you get every single orifice, whether it's a 40,000 BTU or 120,000 BTU, based on the, on the models. We're not gonna sell you four different kits. Uh, these guys don't have to stock four different kits. You get one, you're just gonna end up with extra orifices. So if you got three, four, six, it doesn't matter, it changes. Okay, it's all one. Other than that, most of your parts are generic, right? 
Um, the only other differences on our uh, igniters, we used to have a really, really flimsy uh, weak one that would break all the time. Um, has everybody seen those hot rod igniters? Uh, the ones you can smack on the table and keep on working? We went with one like that. It's a Casera igniter because uh, we had problems with ours and I used to carry those hot rods in my truck. That was my go-to. Um, so that's what we switched to, one of those. Uh, our R&D guys were trying to figure out one. I brought one of those in, smacked on the table and said, try it. And it worked just fine. Um, what you'll find is if you're on an older furnace, you're gonna have to drill out that hole. So you'll have to get access in here, take this out and drill the hole bigger to fit the new igniter. All right, but it totally switches over to the new one. Just need a bigger hole. Uh, where, where'd he go? Eric? Oh, I'm just carrying yeah, this. I know. This sweet little guy. I, I saw you carrying it. This is. <clears throat> Bag. <laughs> oh, wait, oh, yeah. oh, that's the service kit. Every part in there comes labeled with the label on it. Okay. The best part of that is when I manage service guys, they put that on their clipboard. Our warehouse guy would get the new part for them. So we didn't have to worry about what was missing in that. And we had extra parts in there of what we would go through more. More igniters, a couple more extra pressure switches, just so we had a few spares. Because we covered three or four hours from our shop. So I didn't want a guy three hours away and say, oh, I'm out of igniters. So we put extra igniters in there. But as you can see all the parts that you're gonna get in there, right, conversion kits. Um, our conversion kits for propane come with a low cutoff switch, all right? Uh, and if you're not familiar with propane, we don't want to pull the sludge out of the bottom of the tank, so it, sh it shuts it off when the pressure drops. It comes in there with a T, it comes in with a, a pre tap nipple for you and everything, so you can tie it right in. You're not searching for parts, it's all part of the kit. Okay? Uh, on our heat exchangers, um, this is our, our heat exchanger designed as one piece. So, everybody's familiar with the clamshells that are still out there and how the rivets would pop and all that stuff. And then we went to tubular burners. And excuse me, some manufacturers went from two inch down to an inch and a half, and they put a little reducing piece in there and it wasn't sealed, they leaked there too. Ours is one solid piece. What we did was we actually dimpled the heat exchanger. So, and what that does is slow down our fluid gases so we can maximize the total absorption out of it. So if you look down there, you'll see the second pass, the heat exchanger, every tube has compression on both sides. To slow it down, so it's one full piece. I always wonder what they were. Right? <laughs> now we the Vortex Turbulator. Yes, yeah. uh, right. that's what it was kind of design. Yeah. So these are designed a quarter inch slope forward on every installation. <clears throat> all right. So basically, put a piece of S on the back side of it and let it slope forward. So we make sure we have all our our uh, drain everything sloping forward, draining out of the box. Right. We don't want to gain in the back. Um, for us. Um, our heat exchangers, so the 96 or 10 years, right? Full replacement in 10 years if it fails. 97 is 15 years because it's a stainless steel heat exchanger. That's aluminized, Yeah. right? If our heat exchanger fails in nine years, we will give you a new furnace. We will not give you a new heat exchanger, right? So for those who've been doing this for a while, remember, remember, Everybody remembers the carrier heat exchangers? No. Yeah, about two and a half hours to take that out and put it back in, right? When I show you the video, honestly, it's 10 minutes to take that out, but we'll still give you a brand new furnace and not a heat exchanger, provided it's all been registered and all that kind of stuff. The other thing is, I believe, Eric can probably tell me, we are the only manufacturer certified for construction heat. True. Because you can fully remove that heat exchanger and everything and clean it, and you still get full warranty on it during construction heat. <clears throat> okay? So that's the furnace. So we'll we'll do the heat exchanger after uh, for the video, after we watch the video on that. So the heat pump, we've had a couple things where we have had to put um, refrigeration mufflers on the system. Has anybody ever done anything with refrigeration mufflers? Yeah. So we've had a few instances where we had to put them on there. Basically it is, it absorbs the sound, right? Um, usually it happens on a, low, a short line sets. Um, the ones we've had have been on long line sets and they reuse the existing line set through a finished ceiling. So we don't know if the line set was strapped up properly. Is it banging against a two by four at the end or whatever? So we put a few mufflers in, uh, in the systems in certain spots. They're the only ones we've ran into on 
retros where they reuse the existing line sets. So you may run into a spot, you might have to put a muffler on there. It looks like a filter dryer, you just braze it in and then it, it absorbs the sound carried through on the units. Okay? Just you as must a use a TXV line. valve, no piston valves. What? TXVs, yep, no pistons. All TXVs, right? And he was just asking about pressure charts to see if you low pressure in that. You don't need pressure charts on here because the unit has a low cutoff. It will tell you if you're low on pressure because of the accumulator. That's the best part. You can have extra refrigerant in there and the accumulator will hold that refrigerant. All right? So once you've done your vacuum, your pressure test and your vacuum, if you're within that 31 feet, um, take your gauges off then open the unit up. And you're not even losing any refrigerant into your gauges, right? So I don't know if you guys are using um, field piece wireless gauges or you still have old analog gauges like I do, right? Um, I take my gauges off, I lose no refrigerant and the system will run. And if it runs on low cutoff, I know I'm out of a lower refrigerant, right? I don't have to put my gauges on there, get all my temperatures and all that stuff, it's just gonna do it by itself. <laughs> the only spot you're gonna run into an issue is if your TXV slam shot gets plugged, stuff like that, you're gonna know there's no cycle going on there, right? So you can diagnose it that way. Is yeah. The TXV already installed in the, in the case coil? Yes. Okay. Usually. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Usually. Yep. <laughs> so here's uh, the video. If I can make this work. This is the 96Q, hey, but I'm everything's the same. Uh, sales manager for Napoleon HVAC. I'm here today to talk to you about our new 9600Q forced air natural gas furnace. The 9600Q is a natural gas high efficient furnace. It's two-stage ECM multi-speed blower, approved for LP, also upflow insulation for horizontal rain. The uniqueness of this furnace is that it has modular cleaning section. So all our furnaces are modular. Our condo pack we use on our commercial side is modular as well. So I can take a condo pack, take the sheet metal box up by itself, pull my cooling module out, my furnace module, carry empty box up, and then put it in. Instead of carrying all that weight in one shot. Everything's Molex connectors, so no spade connectors either. That connect the low voltage wiring from the control board to the heating section. Next, you need hold the blower section in place. Take care of the leads from the electrical wires so they do not get pinched upon removal. The blower can then be slid across the rails that are back in the Set aside for inspection, maintenance, and cleaning purposes. With the blower section removed, we can now go over a few easy steps to remove the modular heat section. With the clamps out of the way, we can now remove the condensated drain line from the condensated trap. It's a good practice to have a rag on hand and to catch any condensate. We'll then remove four screws from the wedge. <coughs> Two on the right I think in total you're 16 screws to get the whole heat exchanger out. So there's no rubber grommet where it keeps popping out of the hole. It's all molded around one piece, right?
modular heating section can now be removed for inspection, maintenance, and cleaning. So no taking venter motors off, no pressure switches, gas valves, nothing like that. The only trick is if you do a, a vent to your, where you rotate the venter motor to the right, you need to take the venter motor off because part of the head of the motor sticks at the side of the box, right? Our unit and the versatility of being able to the whole right full access to the secondary to use compressed air or a vacuum to do a thorough cleaning of any drywall dust, sawdust, or any other debris that may accumulate on that secondary coil. With the modular versatility of the Napoleon 9600Q, you can easily clean, maintain, and inspect both the secondary and primary heat exchanger from both the top and the bottom of the unit. 9600Q is a testament to the innovation and quality that we at Napoleon put into all of our products. We anticipate this new furnace being a game changer construction market there's seal no no there's seal tape on the side so it does a compression seal on there yeah. uh, if it, it doesn't stay on you can just put seal tape back on there it's just to stop dust and that to go back in so that's the the heat exchanger and how it comes out right like it said on there uh, for construction heat once you do the warranty for it what we require is pictures of it cleaned out of the unit and cleaned uh, and then put back in, and then your warranty still is full during construction heat, right? So the Q was brought out to get more of a price point of the construction, so it's a little uh, price point cheaper than what the 96 is as a standard, but it's still a two-stage, right? It just, you lose insulation on the box and a couple things like that, that lower it. You can't put that UV light in there, but it helps to get a two-stage into the construction market. So. so the standalone furnace over there, right there where the uh, screwdriver is, that's the 96 Q, yeah. Um, two stage X13 blower, um, value engineered a little bit more than the, the live fire. Um, so up below horizontal right only. Um, but uh, that's the, that was what was on the video. On the video, we just had a gray door, both two gray doors. We now put the yeah. red door up on the upper and the, and the, the, the gray on the lower. But uh, no, there's there's been. Um, Two projects in my past life where I had to go and avoid warranty on a new construction site, and I thought I was going to get my ass kicked because, you know, um, I had to avoid the warranty. But the reason why is we had a whole slew of furnaces that were that were popping because uh, they were using during new construction heat, salt dust, drywall dust, all that stuff going through, clogging up that secondary. And I knew my cheap furnace you couldn't service that secondary heat exchanger and make it good again. Um, so it, the, the it, it wasn't good in the beginning, so I don't no, know why they call it good. So there were preliminary failures, right? So, um, so that wasn't a good thing, man. That was really bad. So anyway, this is the only furnace uh, in, in the market that um, is just designed out of the box like that now. So even if it's not new construction, homeowner might have a few dogs, a couple cats. Does they need done every year? No, maybe every three years, four years. Slide that thing out. Give it a good you do cleaning and you're good for another 5,000 miles. Um, so, I, you know, from, from a service standpoint, I think we're in good shape. And then, oh, by the way, you get a good A-coil inspection. When you're doing that, you can get that A-coil inspection because that A-coil sit right there, and the whole, the whole cavity is empty. So you can get a good A-coil inspection, good time to show your homeowner what that coil looks like if they need to upgrade to a UV light, right? So if you don't do it, if you don't sell a UV light, uh, at the kitchen table for the new red install, uh, a few years down the road, that would be a good time to show them um, if the recoil needs to be addressed. Yeah. Uh, so right now, there's 45 videos on there for all three product lines. And there's more and more coming. And what we've done now is they're just working on it now. If you go to our website and the professional support center where you can download manuals and stuff like that, they're putting a tab in there now on the website saying, um, service videos or service support videos, whatever they're going to name it, and that's going to come up on the website as well. But through there you can see um, all the options to go and um, <coughs> look at different videos for hearth grills, HVAC, so they're up there already. Uh, Subcooling, superheat, static pressure, and Delta T. So those are new ones that just got uploaded. Um, 
probably the end of last week. So we're always making more videos um, for the products. And we just started doing these videos in April or May. So we're pumping them out fairly quick. We have one guy on our team that strictly does videos. He used to do uh, snowboarding videos and stuff like that. And now he does the videos for us. Oh, there we go. For his participation, give him a hat. Oh, he had a And then for, <laughs> I had to have one for the picture. For here, you just flip these up. And that door comes off. Um, what we did was on the furnace as well. Um, so normally the vendor motor's here. We put caps on top of these screws so you don't cut your hands when you stick them in there. Wait, what are this? Yeah, what is this for? So those are your two screws for your blower section. Oh, okay. blower. But we put rubber caps on there so you don't have to cut your, scratch your hands or nothing. So from here, uh, remove these two screws. This one here, and this one here from underneath. If you want a shorter bit, we can do a shorter bit. Yep. I'll hold your screws for you. Uh, one on the other side. A magnetic plate will come in perfect. Where's the right magnet now. on yeah. that thing? It probably, it probably fell out years ago. Boom. Oh. Okay. Got and then the from here, all you're going to do is undo those two Molexes. Oh, my thing here. We'll see you around. Yep. Pretty much the whole thing pulls out. That's really yep. good function. Uh, you're going to undo this one that's on the side of this box here. So there's a the top and the bottom. And that removes your 120, right? And now pull this whole section right up. And just set that aside. Okay, so from here, you're going to twist lock that. Just give it a quarter turn. Push it up. And pull those out. Uh, you have to do one mullet at a time because they kind of get jammed in there. Do the next one. And now, normally the trigger motor is on here, right? So from here, uh, undo the four screws, two here, two there. Undo these six ones up here. And then these will pop off. So you can still do this with a plenum on it, right? Or a coil, because this will roll out. So that wedge pops out. Uh, the good part about the wedge too is when you're doing your manometer tests, it just rolls right up. It's just the tape. Um, you can pop this wedge off and get, yep, there's all the pull in. You can get right here to your ports and everything with that wedge off. So you're not fighting to do anything. Or your conversion too. So set that aside. Six screws on the top. should do it like real life where uh, all the screws fall in a dirty dark basement floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, where they at? So there's that. And then from here, you're going to undo one, two, three, four, five, six. Which now you see why you need the longer extension on that version. Yeah. Right? So when I did the end <coughs> last week, the guy gave me a short bit like this. The only difference I could get was this top corner here because I couldn't get in with the drill. Are all these screws the same length? Nope. So they're not. So you nope. Even so these, these are longer, right? Uh, these uh, four here. Majority of these are the same length there. And you the ones that are probably longer. <coughs> yeah, they're longer. Up to the door, yeah. The, the video of removing this is on the YouTube channel. Uh, no. That one's on our website channel. It's going to get moved over to our YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah. I want to show the box when I get back. And there's there's the entire heat exchanger. Wow, you can so actually you can see a service. secondary heat exchanger. Right? South full wind. <clears throat> yeah. Right, exactly. Dog hair, cat hair. Yeah. So, like, when I was in BC, like, 
honestly, I, I did it quick, right? Because I know exactly what I'm doing. And there was a guy sitting in the chair, right here, hold your hand out. And I just started dumping screws in his hand, right? Um, but, you know, for me, it's easy because I, I don't do it all the time, but uh, I, I know the process of it pretty quick, right? And then you just reverse it and put it back together. But have you guys ever <clears throat> attempted to clean a secondary heat exchanger out in the field nope. before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I've pulled them carriers. <laughs> the carriers are miserable. Oh, yeah. they are miserable. Two, two and a half hours, right? It took me yeah, like ten. Yeah, yeah, like peel it open this way. Total. Yeah, mm -hmm. pull it this way. It's like two and a half hours to get into it, then oh. to go put it back together, right? Mm -hmm. And you got like five pieces. You got to put the primary with the secondary. You got to yep. glue this mm -hmm. one. Yes, the with best part silicone. about that is the AC quality, being able to get the, yeah. You're, you're that's, two birds it, with one stone, and right? And that's the yeah. other thing, that's right? Great. So now you can access your AC coil in there. So when I used to do maintenances, right, and I manage the service guys, that's part of our cleaning, right? Taking it out. So we, we had different levels. We had like a... Uh, Give the option for recovery, which you, yeah. before you'd have to recover, pull the thing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we had a three-tier cleaning process, and depending on your equipment, um, you could do a low, medium, or high, right? Cleans, right? The high was, of course, more money, but we also did contracts. So people wrote us checks. $80 a month, <coughs> right, for warranty, and if it went down, we took care of it for you, and you got a better rate for labor rate and all that stuff for emergency calls and that. Well, most of the times you just cash on the check because nothing's breaking down. Mm -hmm. But this was part of our preventive maintenance. So if you did that high tier program, this was a full preventive maintenance. And we actually provided you a video of it coming out too. Mm -hmm. So we actually recorded it on the floor so you knew we actually did it. And they would upload the video to the homeowner so they could see it. 